Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With the Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what, people that train out here, it's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash Table Talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund no risk, money back guarantee. Head over to drinkelement.com backslash table talk. It's one of the best ways that you can support the podcast and your training is to join the crew. When you join the crew, you get an extra crew cast podcast every single month. <laughs> you also get access to our Discord, which has a training Q&A with Team Elite FTS members. You get form checks. You can upload any of your training footage and have your lifts diagnosed, sometimes within minutes, by multiple people. Access to close to 30 different eBooks, training logs, and first sign up access to our weekly weekend training retreats, uh, train your ass off, and other events that we do. Biggest takeaways from that though, what people enjoy the most and get the most out of is the training Q&A and the form checks, as well as the extra podcast. Hey guys, I'm back in the gym with another limited edition apparel drop. This is the new Live Learn Pass On shirt. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our cambered grip American cable attachment. This attachment has four grips and it's cambered. So when you flip it, it actually becomes eight grips. And if you turn it upside down, there's actually 16. This is one of our most used cable attachments out in the gym. <clears throat> Even got that full range of motion. We got a second limited edition drop this month as well. Head over to EliteFTS.com, pick up the shirt, pick up the cable attachments, and we'll see you next time. Today's episode is brought to you by EliteFTS.com. Founded in 1998 with the primary aim to live, learn, and pass on. Please help EliteFTS support this mission by smashing the like button, leaving a comment, sharing with a friend, and thinking of us for your training needs. If you can put it in a gym bag or load weights on it, Elite FTS has it. What's going on? I'm Dave Tate, and we are broadcasting from the middle of the Elite FTS weight room, where the underground still thrives and you're part of the crew. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. <laughs> All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk. Uh, the guest today, again, is Dave Hoff, really requires no introduction. Hello. <laughs> From the last podcast that we had, it was him and Anthony. Uh, the WPO has come and gone. Dave won again. So we're going to talk about that meet. We're going to recap that meet. Um, we'll get into how your training was for the meet, but let's just get straight into the meet first. So you were telling me off air that on the way there, you felt like you were going to pop. Right. So, yeah, you're, you're... so, so, um, and I think this kind of couples with the training. So I trained, I, I don't want to say I changed training up a ton. I just went to a lot of stuff I did long, like years and years ago. And it was a lot of minimalistic stuff, stuff Lou would yell at me for, you know, like, well, you can't do that. You'll blow this off, you know, type thing. Yeah. Um, so generally I just lifted a lot of heavy weights all the time. Like what, like that I just, you know, you know how West side you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're maxing out every week. And it was kind of like, I really kind of like stuck to that and it made me grow. Like I just like in a week I'd put on five pounds. Like I take a heavy squat gain, like I do a free squat in the gym, gain mm -hmm. five or 10, pounds. like not 10, but like five pounds. And then it would slowly kind of come off. And then three weeks later I'd be doing something again like that. And then it would, it would push past that. And I'm looking at the scale like, man, like, but gear's getting tight, you know, like yeah. I, I would put, I'd put my squat suit on the gym briefs that fit four weeks ago, or like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like telling people go around, I'm like, go, go, tell me what size these are. Are these the same? Did I see the same size? And yeah, so everything was very tight and very uncomfortable. What did you weigh before you left? 307. So I got on the scale at the gym and I was like, well, I need to make sure, um, cause every year I go, I, I weigh myself and I kind of have a, an idea of what like body weight. Cause you know, Usually, anytime I come in these WPOs, I'm kind of like around like a like a low 290. Between mm -hmm. 89 and 94 is kind of usually where I land. Uh, I've had a couple where I'm a little bit bigger than that, but 
Um, so I was 307 when I left Columbus. I didn't really, you know, so the heaviest that you've been before going to correct. Right? Yeah. Okay. This was, this would have probably been, uh, there was another meet, uh, in 2019 where I was 312, three around the same mm -hmm. size. And, um, I did a, I did a meet out in Iowa. I'd won a Jim Grandix meet. It was a meet out there and uh, uh, it's in the, it's in the new movie coming out, but I tried to squat the, the world record at 1273 at the time. And I get fucking smashed with it because nothing fits and everything's yeah. tight. And um, so that's what, that was my like, Oh no, if I get this big, those things happen. So mm -hmm. I'm like, man, I don't want to really be this big. Um, Cause like I, f I don't wear tight gear, but when it gets tight, you know, I get a lot of carryover from it. Yeah. And it's just, you're just walking that fine line. So what are you doing at that point? Are you eating less? Are you pulling uh, less sodium? Yeah. Typically I just start watching sodium. I'm like, yeah. okay, well, I'm maybe not going to eat uh freshest big boy today. You know, <laughs> like I'm not going to get my super big boy combo with my thousand grams of sodium. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, I kind of just, anytime, anytime I'm wanting to just like get fluid off me, I, I kind of go to like fish, you know, fish and rice, just stuff that like, and I don't, and I don't just strictly eat that but when i get meals like that in my body like burns through it and it kind of wants more it starts taking that mm -hmm. that that flurf off me now what day did you lift on saturday or sunday uh, so i left i think we left wednesday uh we left at like what 3 30 in the morning mm -hmm. and uh me and a group i got like i said i got a great group of guys and uh we always run a big suv and then they just we just drive power down through there uh i hate flying on planes and stuff but um yeah, we drove down there, got got there Wednesday night. Uh, I think weighed in Friday morning. That was pretty uh that was probably the longest I ever had to walk for a weigh in. That was pretty cool. Uh yeah, we just pulled up at the Orange County Convention Center and you, you know, I'm like, "Well, where the hell like Yeah. Where the hell do I go?" And you had to walk up to this little people at the visitation center and like, "Oh, yes, sir, you are upstairs down the hall to the right." So the upstairs and down the hall was like going to your concourse at the airport. Mm -hmm. So it, 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 the building seemed bigger than the Arnold Classic, like it was bigger and nicer. So it had to go a little further to uh, weigh in. They had these little side rooms and we'd walk in and you'd go back there, fill your stuff out and weigh in. So uh, like I said, I got there, I got there and I weighed in. I think I weighed in at like 296. So I always, typically, like whenever I drive like long distances, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, maybe I'm just not sitting on my ass eating food all day long. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like I just kind of get out of that rhythm. Um, yeah. Uh, well, I weighed in at 296. And I was like, well, that's, that's better. That I don't really think that's probably, that's right. That's right around the heaviest I usually weigh in for meats. Did you look at the meat site before that after you weighed in or did you just go when? So, so I like, dude, like I, I, I just don't, like, I don't mind talking to people and stuff like that, but like, I don't, I, I just got to get out of there. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like, I need to go eat food, sit down, relax, and I need to like literally not think about that. You know, some people, when they get to these meets, they want to go look at everything and like, wow, this is cool. I, I, like I was telling you earlier, you get this like overstimulation type mm -hmm. feel where after you get so overstimulated, you're just kind of like, who, you know, you don't really care. I didn't want to, I mean, I kind of saw pictures of it, so I knew it looked cool. <clears throat> I knew it was uh, pretty much in the middle of the expo. And I was like, all right, so I know where it was at. They basically had a map to tell you how to get there. They're like, hey, you come in this store and they'll. And what was cool about that is they had all these these people that were working the doors. Like you couldn't just go in and out. They'd be like, stop, let me see your band. And you would tell them, you're like, hey, I'm doing this. And they would like know exactly what. Oh, yes, you're you're down this way to this. It, was, it wasn't like you go to some of these meets and they're like, what are you doing here? What do you need? Hold mm -hmm. on, let me check your credential. They're just like, they kind of, they already knew who we were. <laughs> So, uh, we, um, I basically weighed in and just went, went, right. like, what I go eat at Uno's, I ate a bunch of pasta and all right. Stuff. So then you get there for the warm ups. How did, what did you think when you got to the site, to the warm ups, and you're getting, you're walking through? Well, like I said, like, well, uh, what was also cool is we could pull up right out in front of the building. Like I didn't have to go find a garage. Mm. Like if you were a competitor or something, you you could pull up in front of the orange County. It was a big place. You could pull up right in front of the doors and uh, you pull up and tell the people that there's always guys there like directing mm -hmm. traffic. And they're like, what are you, what are you doing here for? I'm like, well, I got to go way in. They're like, go over here and put your blinkers on and uh, have someone stay with your vehicle. And so if you were a competitor, they'd, they'd pull you off the side of the road and let you run in the building real quick and do whatever you had to do and come back out. Yeah. So that was really cool. And that was, that was like a big plus for me. So the, the morning of the meet, we basically did the same thing. We pulled up out front of the building and, uh, 
I uh, got all my stuff, started walking in, went up these escalators. It was on this like second, second tier floor type place. And, um, like we're my, as soon as the doors open, it looks just like the Arnold classic. You know I mean? You walk in there, it's a like big, tall ceilings. It, it really didn't, from the big differences I noticed, it seemed like uh, quality over quantity it seemed like, uh, I, I, I much, I'd never been to an Olympia up until that point. Cause you know, it's always in Vegas. And it's mm-hmm. kind of hard to catch it. Uh, I've lived in Columbus my whole life. So I've been to the, I mean, you know, Arnold classic is just like a redundancy now. It's just mm-hmm. like, it's like Christmas. Oh, it's Arnold classic season. Here it is. You know, like, uh, so, you know, I think the Arnold is cool and it has its perks, but, uh, if you're asking which one I would rather go to, it'd probably be the Olympia mm-hmm. by far. Uh, so yeah, I walked in the door and it, uh, they, it was like a side door straight to the meet. Like, it, like, and there was like nobody there. Like I could just walk straight to it. So we're all, we walked straight down. They had a pretty good warm up room. Like the warm up room had three monoliths in it, three benches. It had, uh, all the, just everything you need, the right bars, enough space. I mean, there wasn't a ton of us. Like, I think there was 35 or 40 guys or something like that. And we had two flights. So it wasn't, it wasn't mm-hmm. anything crazy to need this huge space, but we had enough room for sure. So I was pretty excited. Like, I was like, okay, I'm not smothered. There's not really, uh, and it's not that I try to keep away from people. I'm just, I'm just need to do what I got to do. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I kind of just put my stuff down and get where I want to be. And then, you know, I always go through this, this, I don't know, the period of dread where you're just like, what am I doing here? Like, can I, you know, I need, I want to go home. You know, like, like, where's the door? You know, I want to get mm-hmm. out of here. You're like, wait, no, I can't go home. Like, <sighs> So, yeah, I'm in there twiddling my thumbs, figuring out if I should be doing this. But, yeah, so then, uh, yeah. So then how'd how'd those squat warm-ups go? Uh, Squat warm-up, I mean, just like about like any other one. You know, like, you know, I do one, I hate to say it, but, like, it's gotten to the point where uh, the numbers, it just takes a lot of training to do these numbers. And uh, how can I put it? they they always feel like shit like <laughs> like i never I, there's been like really a few times i go into warm up room and i'm like yes you mm-hmm. know like and like i said i think it's because i was in the uh in a big big place and a lot of distractions and noises and people and most meets are not really like that they're kind of like low key and you kind of have your own little corner over there but like everyone was in your corner and there's people walking everywhere and so it was it was it was different like i've done those i've done i've been in those kind of meets before Mm -hmm. so it's like i knew i knew what to expect so it wasn't like overly stimulated to the point where i couldn't think what i was doing but yeah i started warming up and I put my gear on pretty quick because it was super tight up into that point. So I was like, I don't know how long this is going to take me to get in this shit. So I put my briefs on and just took, I, I go pretty quick. So I'm not there to work out in the warm up room. You know, some people, yeah. they want to take like a 50, 60, 70 pound jumps like every time, you know, and I'm just like, dude. So I think I, I did like four, 200s raw, I think mm-hmm. that's 455. I put my briefs on, went right to like 300s. I think that's like 675 mm-hmm. or something like that. And then I just immediately put my suit on or tried to. Mm -hmm. So I'm back there like trying to squeeze into my squat suit. And I'm like, oh, no, I can't really breathe. That's great. Uh, um, I think uh, I think my first I think my first attempt, I I just go. So like I went I think I went from 675 to like 860 or 70. Mm -hmm. And then I went like 97. I'm sorry. Excuse me. I went like 860, 960, 1060. And the whole time in training, like like. And I don't know if, if it's just me getting lazy, but dude, wrapping your knees is a pain in the ass, man. Like it just takes so much time. Like to me, it does. Mm-hmm. So like the all in training, I'd, I mean, you can ask any of the guys I train with, like I'd work up a 1060 with no knee wraps just cause I didn't want to fuck it. I didn't want to take the time and put them on and almost be at the gym another 20 minutes. Like, it's just like, yeah, I don't, Oh, it's like, if I can't do this, then we don't need to be here type mm-hmm. thing. I guess that's just kind of where I've gotten, if I can't do this, then I don't even need to worry about this other stuff. Yeah. So do you wrap in the warm up? That, uh, that time I did. So the difference between training was is uh, I did never wrap for a ten sixty in the gym. Yeah, I just went out. I just took it and did it. And then when I got to the meet, I knew I would. You know, I was going to put one on. So I got in there, put knee wraps on, did ten sixty. It felt, you know, it felt it felt fine. You know, I, when I unracked it, I, I don't know if I stepped too far up into the rack, but I unracked it and just started falling backwards. 
I'm like, take it, catch it, catch it, take it mm-hmm. quick, you know, like grab me. And there was a second where I thought they weren't going to grab me. I like said it like three or four times and was like, please help, you know, like, <laughs> and they grabbed me and put me back in. And then, so anytime that happens, you know, it's like the, 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 the ticker's still ticking, you know, you got knee wraps on, you just try to take it out, you fell backwards, you put it back in. Mm-hmm. So here we are like twice as long as it's supposed to take. Yeah. Rather than just getting under it and doing it real quick. And then, uh, so yeah, that was like 1065 or something like that. And, uh, um, but I just went down, stood up with it, and most of the time I just go down to where it locks up, and then I and then I try to hit a dip and come up, and then let the judges make a decision. Do you do that in the warm up room for that? Oh, last all one? of them, all of them. Okay, so that, that's just what I do. Like, yeah, I box squat and then I free squat. They're two separate things. Mm-hmm. Like my my box squat is nothing like my free squat, and they're they're like they're like like I said, they're two different things, two different. And I think people they kind of get that conflated. They just see it as a squat. Um, I'm always like attacking proactive. Like I'm not waiting. I'm get. I'm, I'm, I'm like slowly swinging until I'm allowed to type thing. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that's a weird analogy, but what I basically do is I get like, I'll hear like a three, two, one. And then after I hear one, it, it kind of, and it also kind of depends on how shit is going. Sometimes I might hit the dip sooner and it might look a little higher or something like that. Uh, but sometimes when I go down, I'll start, you'll, I'll start shifting or something. I think on the second squat, you'll see here, uh, I stepped too wide on one foot. So like one foot, when I unracked it, I, I kind of went like this and I felt like my foot was a step too wide. And I remember I went down and I started, I heard three, two, and then I started like shifting back and forth. And I was like, dog, I, I almost lost it. And I was mm-hmm. like, please no, stay with me. You know? And I heard three, two, one. And in that, in an instant like that, I, once I hear one, I just hit the dip and come up. Yeah. Um, I don't, I don't wait until I'm there. I just count on the dip and the judges, you just kind of, it's, it's a very quick thing. So mm-hmm. you like, I'm not, I'm kind of pat like, dude, I've done squats all over the place. I've done, I've, I've had one, everyone has it. You probably have one, maybe it shouldn't pass some that, get turned down that you shouldn't get then you have all the good ones in between and i'm just of the i'm i'm just going to attack it and make the judges make a choice like yeah. i'm not going to i'm i'm the whole tapping shit like when you get there let's give you a tappy it's like can't we just perform a squat and get judged on it you know like why does mm-hmm. everyone need this extra help with a tap and stuff like that it's really not that hard to call depth you know what i'm saying so I guess the moral of the story is I try to get close. I hear a three, two, one. When I, when I start getting around, I try to, I try to like, in my brain, I know it probably happens a lot faster outside of my brain, but in my brain, I try to go like one, one thousand one, and I just, and it's a, it's it's. I learned it from Big Iron. That's all they used to do. If you remember them dudes in the mm-hmm. past, like like Becca and Jimmy and uh, like Nick Hatch, um, who else? Sean Frankel. You'd watch those guys squat. They'd go down, and he would he would tell them where they were at, and I thought they dipped twice as far as me. So they would start at like two inches and dipped. And I would be like, how do you fall that dude? I would just fall straight through the floor. Yeah. So like my whole thing was I tried to tighten that, that window up and get around like an inch or wherever they're telling me I'm at. And then I just hit that dip. And uh, hopefully that's enough. If it happens quick and they can't make a call good for me, you know what I mean? I'm just kind of. I'm so just, what was the opener then? Uh, 1168 was my opener. All right. Let's see if you can find that. I think we got it queued up. So is this it? This actually felt all right. Uh, I hate watching myself. (laughs) This is why I'm not on the internet. I hate watching myself. (laughs) Look how tight, look how, look how big my belly is. That's all Kellen would tell me. She's like, your belly's way too fucking big. She's like, dude, I see you sit down and your belly's hitting your, hitting your thighs. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh my God. Like I, I feel it, dude. It was, it was. So but, the gear felt tighter. Oh my! Like yeah, tighter, you yeah. can see how tight it is. Look yeah. how tight it is in my legs. Yeah. Look how tight it is. My belly was the worst. And then I got my belt. So I always tell people this: that where you put the where you put the latch of your belt matters. Like if if you if you get the belt latch on too far to the left or too far to the right, and it gets in that the crease, crease of your yeah. hip, you won't break on that side. You know what I mean? You will actually, you'll squat crooked mm-hmm. and one side will get down. That's why sometimes you like squats might just look bad and you'll get a light on one side. Mm-hmm. So, and then you look at the, you'll look and somebody will have a belt buckle like in the, in the crease of their hip yeah, their yeah groin yeah. or whatever. So that's one thing that I like, I'm real anal about that kind of shit. So how'd that one feel? 
it felt it felt really good honestly it didn't feel like anything I, i'm kind of like a meat lifter like once i get out there and in front of people like i like kind of i think it's like something louis always instilled in me i thrive on expectations and when i go out there everyone expects me to do that mm-hmm. you know what i mean they see me or whether they even if they haven't seen me like i just people expect me to do things no matter what and i expect that twice over for myself so like i go i just it's just a it's just a switch i hate to the sound so cliche yeah. But it's just a switch that gets flipped and you just know what you got to do. And man, I'll tell you what, one different thing about this meat is, dude, I like can't get, I cannot get fired up anymore. And it's like different. I think I went from like, uh, I don't know. I, I had. Is this the same one here? I like went from the Spartan aggression, you know, like this is Sparta, let's do that. You know what I mean? And that, I think, triggers a, like, I get whacked out of my gourd, dude. So it, like, triggers a fight or flight response in your body. And when that happens, it's almost like your body dumps its adrenal glands or something. And I'm butchering the shit out of this, but this Mm -hmm. is what it feels like to me. Yeah. Then I get sick. So I'll get, I get all worked up. I perform the lift and I'm fucking just don't, not even just trying to, it feels like you're just in a tornado. You know, Mm -hmm. you've done it a hundred times. mm <clears throat> and uh oh sorry what? yeah so did that happen after that opener so i pre- so back in the back like i hit the 1060 and uh um i was kind of under it too long like i remember i was telling you I was, I, the, the clock kind of went past mm-hmm. the ticking point when i unracked it and i fell backwards that you know and then they put me back in i should have already been putting it in the rack you know what mm-hmm. i mean so then it's like i that extra time it's like I have to like then then you have to you have to you have to pull more you have to add, you have to tell your body to do more and then once you, and like I said it it like it'll you get this fight it, fight or flight like this adrenaline jump now at this age or this like port in my career of lifting weights age whatever I just can't do that anymore because I get so jacked up and I'll need to puke and if I start puking I'll start cramping my inner dude uh, mm. intercostals will cramp everything will, it just it's just it's just a downhill thing so like my main thing was like. I need to like be, I almost went to like Bruce Lee focus, you know, mm-hmm. you must become water, you know, yeah, like, just you, more chill. Yeah. You, you just more, more in my own, you know, I wasn't trying to get in my own way. I yeah. wanted to perform the lifts. I wanted to win because this would have been my six, six WPO championship belt. And this one kind of meant the most because it's the, it was the real belt. Like not that they're not all real belts, but when you look at that's the, they brought back the, the throwback belt. And that's mm-hmm. something I really wanted. Is that the Olympia? It's a big, it's, it doesn't really get any bigger than that. Yeah, go back to that live stream because I want to see the second attempt. Second attempt mm. was that one scared me. And I don't know what this one is here. You know that well. That's twelve seventy eight. So that's the third. So on the live stream, you'll have the second. <clears throat> yeah, but the squats felt the the like in terms of like weight. It, the, the only the first ones on the live stream. Then mm. it ends. All right, the second, so, yeah, walk me through the second one. What so the second there? one, uh, it, it it felt fine. So uh, when I when I mean fine, like it, when it come like in terms of like how weight felt to me that day, mm-hmm. I was on. Like I was like, I was like, I can I can lift anything. Like, um, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Type thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a lot of things that went into the the choosing of the jumps I did. Um, well, what was the second attempt? That twelve forty one. Okay, and why did you decide that? So twelve forty one gives me a three thousand pound total. Okay. Okay, and I got to win the meet. You know what I mean? Yeah. You, you have some dudes coming in this meet where this comp it's like it's hard now. Mm-hmm. Like you got you got two you got dudes that are two twenty damn near totaling twenty seven hundred. Mm-hmm. Well, I think the second place guy totaled like twenty six sixty two mm-hmm. at two twenty. Squatted the world record squat. Yeah. 11 13 or something like that so you know you have like a, a frankel-esque type person and i, I think is uh we go by gloss burner formula in the wpo and i think his gloss burner was a little over 700 like 705 and i think mine was 740 mm-hmm. so like i need 3000 to beat those smaller dudes like i gotta probably edge it out like you know i could go pound mm-hmm. for pound and really edge them out but like i it's this realm beats these numbers like once i hit this once i get over this three three thousand pound number it's going to take so much more for them yeah uh so i try to get into this realm of where they can't like it, it's just out of where they can reach and if they get out of 
uh, if they try to do something a little more than they are capable of, that you know, it just it it just causes people to make dumb decisions. You know, what yeah. I, mean? I I try to push it in a realm that makes it really hard for them to even come close. They're either going to have to choose second or try to win. You know what I mean? So how did the second go? Uh, the second squat. So I walked out, um, and again, it was a very big crowd. Like I was, I mean, I was in the. Um, I was I went to all the WPOs that were at the Arnold Classic in their inceptions from like oh three four five mm -hmm. six seven I went to every single one of them, and um, this was really close to that. Um, I think the only difference was was the production stage, mm -hmm. which uh, that that's all coming from what I understand. But beside the point, um, uh, so I, I walked out there and it, like I said, big crowd. It reminded me a lot of it. I did the animal cage. Uh, I don't know maybe. 2011 or something like that and uh it was a uh, very reminiscent of like a an of like a a turbo sized animal cage there was there, just people as far as you can see rows of people they had they had a little uh i don't want to say little there, there was a place where a couple hundred people could maybe sit in front of it mm -hmm. and there was just then there was just people as far as you can see so i walked out there i looked up and i was like uh, you, weird shit goes through your head and i was like wow that's a lot of people like mm -hmm. i wasn't expecting that but anyway beside the point so the, I went 1168, I called for 1241. Um, to me, that was a PR from the last meet. So I, this is where I kind of like, I, I am a proponent of practicing what you preach. I'm, I do the things I, I, that I tell mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? I do the things that I tell you that I do. Like, um, so I, and especially for this, so the first and foremost was do more than I did last year. I squatted 1234 last year. This year is 1241. That's more than I did last year. Let's progress. Let's like, this kind of goes back to the last uh, podcast where we were talking about the 1278 squat. And when I went from, I went 1173 and jumped right to it and just squatted it. Um, but I didn't really get in there and conquer numbers above 1250. You know, I was real proficient in like 1215s and the 20s and the 30s, and I just jumped to 70, and I just tried to ride that wave of just jumping to it, and I just had it. I just had a good day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And sometimes that's hard to swallow. You're like, well, it was just a really. I can do it, but it's you know, I got to back up, take two steps backwards to go. You know, yeah. three steps forward type thing. So I kind of just pulled everything back. I was like, all right, I'm going to go back to uh, establishing a total winning and pushing PRs, you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So 1241 got me enough for, to, I could total over 3000 with that. How did it feel though? Oh, so, uh, I walked out there and I remember I got under it and, I um, I stepped too wide and I knew this as soon as I unracked it. Um, I got under it, uh, went through my whole thing and, you know, I looked at my feet and, and it was it was like I caught something out of the corner of my eye, but I was like, fuck it, I've been under here too long, I gotta keep going. Because uh, like I told you, just like in the warm-up room, when the numbers get bigger, the, the ticker moves faster. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so uh, I remember I stepped too, it felt in my brain like I stepped a little too wide. And, and you always see me when I step up to the squat rack, like I step up into the rack. Like you'll see me go way up into the rack and I kind of come back to it. And the reason I do that is I would rather unrack a squat and fall backwards and somebody just catch me mm -hmm. rather than me unrack it and then start falling forward and dump 1,200 yeah. pounds over my yeah. head and sandwich me and blow it. It's just, man, mm -hmm. it's a lot easier not getting hurt the other way. So I, that's kind of like my mentality of always stepping up. And I, I think, like I said, the fatter I've gotten through this training cycle, the, the wider step I take. You know, your belly gets bigger mm -hmm. and wider. You step wider. And I just think I overstepped it, stepped too wide, got under there, unracked it. It felt good. You know, I was like, great. Yeah, I was like, great. Super. Felt like the last one didn't. The squats didn't feel any different from the first to the third. They all kind of. Mm -hmm. So I remember I went down here, three, two, one. I did my dip. I stood up and uh, I heard, I heard lift is good. And then <laughs> this dude, dude in the front row yelling. I think it was Fred Clary. He's like, 590, 590. This dude's yelling, want me to take 13. I'm like, dude, like, I just, like, <laughs> Like he, he, you must try 13 something. I'm just like, okay. So they're going in the back and they're like, what do you want to do? And I'm just like, I know I felt after that one, I could squat 1300. I was like, I can squat 1300 pounds and I can do it now. I was like, or, but, and then there's the ors or the butts. And this is the, uh, I think, what's the word I'm looking for? maturity um, yes like uh yeah um i've just lifted weights a long time yeah, and after yeah. after you get in like this is why i told experience. you experience experience yeah, yes experience. i can't believe i couldn't come yeah. up with that but it's almost like 
I told you before, once you get there, once it's a possibility and it's not like it's not my wish or my want anymore, you have to just be like, go for it. Like, I'm not going to overstep. So I said, hey, could I squat 13? I, I think I, my two numbers were 13, 13. I was going to do 1322 in the chips. That had been the biggest squat of all time. So 600 kg, that would have been, uh, it would have been like a, I don't know, like a 70 or 80 pound jump or something like mm -hmm. that. And I make those all the time. So it's not, it's not, and at those numbers, once you're used to that kind of stuff, dude, I trained a lot. I squatted, I squatted 1250 or more, probably three or four times in this training cycle, but I didn't, I didn't take the 13s. Mm -hmm. So I kind of pulled back and I really perfected the making, just getting through those first two. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, uh, like I remember the first time I put a squat, I know I'm getting way off trip subject here, but, um, yeah. So I'll get back to the squat. So like I said, I stepped too wide and, um, went, got the squat, went through it, went in the back warm up room. They asked him what I want. It was either 1322 in the chips or 1278, which was a PR. And, and you probably heard me say this. It took me four years. Yeah to get a five pound PR on my bench press. So here I am, I'm like, okay, do I take a shot? 1300 pounds isn't guaranteed. I've not, uh, you know, I, I'm, I know, like I knew I could do it, but it's like, I'm going to get a PR. So I just went 1278 and just squatted, just got a PR. And that, that took four years. Mm -hmm. I haven't squatted 1270 since 19. Yeah. Now that one, we have that video of, I believe that was the, the one, the Instagram one, which uh, actually that shows the crowd there as well. All right, so when you go ahead and pause that for a minute. And so when you come out, you notice the crowd, right? At what point does the crowd disappear for you? Um, it's pretty pretty much right about there, because right when you see me right here, you see me kind of fidgeting around. I'm I'm trying to get my feet set to where like my toes not pointing. The big thing for me is I have to make sure my toes are pointing the same way. Like I can't get one toe pointed, you know, further to the left and the other one pointed straight ahead because that, that, that dictates where your knees go. Mm -hmm. So my whole thing is I got to get my knees going out and not because your knees come in, you're going to blow your knees off. It's going to fold you mm -hmm. and bad things will happen. But so me, I'm just trying to get my feet set and fiddling around with my feet, getting, making sure it's good on my back. And I always, I always try to set it on like the bottom of side of my traps and where my, my delts are. And this is the first time I've even seen this should have lowered the rack and that's another thing i do i lowered the shit out of the rack a little dip ski mm -hmm. what did they say looked looks good i'll take it yeah so what did you think after that so after the the second I stood up with it, I said I should have went thirteen twenty two. I was like, I just I hit it just right, man. Dude, those squats are so big, dude. Like it's it's not it, like I hate to try to say I make them look easy, but like it, those are hard. They're hard to execute. Like things have to be very right, and 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 everything has to be like your from where you like I say where your feet, your toes, like how it's sitting on your back. Because dude, like if I don't put it right in my back and I unrack it, sometimes the bar just bends in the, in the hooks. Mm -hmm. So like I have to do things like they they ask me when the meat comes around, where do you where do you want the hooks? You want them in or out? And I'm like in the middle. They're like I don't know if we can do that. I'm like yes, yeah, you fucking can. Like put them in the middle. So that's actually something Chuck. Chuck did with mm -hmm. me. It was like back when I totaled 3010 a couple, couple years back, uh, I was having trouble getting them out of the rack. And he looked up. He's like, dude, just put the hooks in the middle. So it's like where the bar would bend, the hooks are like picking it back up. Mm -hmm. Which, and as these weights go up, dude, I'm, and I'm always having to adjust the rack. It's this big thing. It's not like you just put it down there, you put it in the hook, and you walk out and you squat it. It's like once I hit this number, all right, I need you to bring the rack down to this number. Um, because as the weights go, get, go heavier, the, you know, the bar, the room on the bar starts to run out, which causes the bar to mm -hmm. bend and flex. And then if I, if I don't sit there and like, you'll kind of see, I never really like jam them straight out the rack. It almost looks like I can barely, I don't want to say barely get them out, but I really ease them out the rack because dude, I've dropped 1250 in the gym. I mean, last time we were talking to Anthony, they're all like, you know, I stood up, the bar rolled down my back and fucking fell off and they all caught it. And they're all looking at me like, dude, you okay? I'm like, sometimes it rolls, buddy. I can't mm -hmm. stop it. 1200 pounds. So they're hard squats, but there's nothing like it. Now you said there that you should have adjusted the rack. Yeah. So like as a, 
as the weights get hit bigger, you have to, like I said, you have to bring the rack down to adjust for the weight that you're putting on it. Um, and I, sometimes I, I, you'll always find yourself in Anthony's one of them. I always yell at him. He always, I, anytime the, it's, and I do it too. As the weight gets heavier, it's almost like the same thing with the bench. You keep trying to put your grip out further. It's like, as the squat goes up, you want to get a wider stance. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And before you, you take a step wider, you're shortening yourself. And that racks, and you know, if you have the same rack height and you stepped wider, the bar is now higher. So you're trying to unrack it and you're pushing it. Before you know it, your legs are locked out, the bar's still on the rack, and then you do one of these shrug yeah. things, you know. So you but when you get to those big, big squats, dude, it, a lot of that little stuff matters. Like so I usually always crank it down, I'll like drop it a half, make sure they're in the middle, um, type stuff. Mm -hmm. Then now you go into the bench after that. How much time did you have? Oh, I think I had. So they use, they've given us like a 15 or 20 minute break. And then I had a flight ahead of me. So, mm -hmm. I'm, you know, 35, 40 minutes, something like that, maybe a little bit more. Um, and I, I kind of, as long as I'm not cramping, dude, like if I start cramping, it's over. So like, I got to kind of keep moving and like, I'm just drinking stuff, eating bananas, uh, drinking th this stuff here. They, they gave some of uh that electrolyte stuff yeah. out to meat and i started cramping real bad and i take some of that stuff and it and it it was like it was gone oh yeah the almond stuff i was the shit it was i'm a i'm a firm believer like if it works i'll tell you um but yeah so like you know i did the squat and i got all the squat shit off and i was like all right let's walk around and uh i try to keep moving because like if i sit down i'll just sit there and get cold and freeze and then and then you then you don't you want to go home and take a nap after well as you walk around there's again there's a ton of people right so is there people that what's the warm-up room look like do so the warm people watch you warm up yes. or is it closed off yes they can so how it, how it was set up it was it is about the size of the gym here mm -hmm. and um the stage had a big uh had a big um wpo banner with some pipe and drape and then the crowd was in front of that and then you down the side they had this pipe and drape that was only about to your your hip mm -hmm. so when you walked behind the curtain there was it was you know you could you could see right it was like as high as this table yeah. you know you could see right over into the warm-up room so you know there was you know i start warming up and uh, people were coming up to the side and asking how much is on the bar and then <laughs> i've got yeah. guys like just just get away you know just get away go over there you know leave them alone i had people coming up there was some guy that came up and asked me for a picture like like right after my squat i'm like dude i i need a minute like mm -hmm. i was like after the meet so if you want pictures if you ever this is just if you want to like ask me for a picture like i don't i don't care about it just not like when i'm squatting or and, and not <laughs> or, or like directly after it like when i'm coming off trying to figure out what planet i'm on don't don't mm -hmm. come up please don't come up and ask me for a picture because mm -hmm. i get I, so yeah there's that that kind of bugged me a little bit but uh so I'm in the corner there. I kind of was off into a little corner and I had this little this little place set up where all my stuff was at and we kind of had chairs around it. So I was kind of like in the middle of the chairs and I had a little chair barrier where all my guys would sit and kind of mm -hmm. like give me a bubble. And um the bench was kind of funny. So this is this is funny. Uh I had no idea what was going to happen in the bench press. Like no idea. Like I just didn't know. I was like, well, I've benched 925, 935 every day. I've done it every meet for the past 15 years. I should be able to do that. I guess I should rewind a little bit. Um, so last year at the WPO, I had, I had a 975 bench, and I was down on my chest, and I heard something make a, like, like a noise, and like, like a popping weird noise, and I felt it down in here, like my tricep. And I thought I tore my tricep. I thought of always thinking, I'm like, did I just do that? But I think it was something in my shoulder. Like, I don't know what it was. Um, something right here on the collarbone. I don't know what it's called. Um, but I, I, I was, I got this knot like on my collarbone and I don't know if it was scar tissue building up in an area just from, uh, always doing bench shirts and doing low boards. Cause dude, I was doing like 11 twenties on a one board and stuff like that in a, in a poly shirt. Mm -hmm. And, um, 2022 beat beat the shit out of my shoulders like for because i was i was really trying to bench 1100 and um i remember that so last year's wpo uh something popped i just felt something cut loose and it, and I, and it just hurt hurt 
Like it just felt like I had tendonitis, tendinosis, all the tendinosis was in my <laughs> was going on in there, dude. And uh, I had limited mobility. I just had weakness, you know, like you know when you tear something and you try to push and it just won't, it just you don't have it there. So it took me that meet last year was also in November, and it took me till March, April, more like May to where. So around March is when I started like bench, being able to bench raw and I couldn't even dude I didn't I couldn't bench off my chest. I was doing board presses. You know, I was still getting into like the high sixes raw and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but like anytime I tried to get down towards my, my chest, it just really aggravated it. So, you know, I put a put a bench shirt on and I started working down. I did some two boards. I got up to a little over a thousand, like a thousand twenty five or something like that, a thousand nineteen in the gym. And I was like, all right, I'm not going to go any heavier than this number. So I didn't go any heavier than 1,020 or something like that, around that 1,025 area. And I just slowly started working that number down as the meet got closer. Um, so I, uh, my last bench workout in the gym, I did 1,019 because I use a kilo plates and I, uh, to a one board. And I was like, okay. You know, it, it I've, I, it's felt faster before, but it's like it's a thousand and it was moving fine. So I was like, all right, and I can I could get it to the top, make sure I held it and stuff. I was like, okay, so I should be able to bench at least nine twenty five. You know, that's what I'm thinking. Mm -hmm. So you know, and I and I did those. I did all the attempts off the board. So I did the twenty five, the seventy five, and then my third was going to be like around a thousand twenty or something like that. Um, so I remember I I uh, was back there warming up. So this is a before I get into the whole the whole platform thing I'm, I'm sitting there warming up right and i'm like sitting on my chair and i'm in the back of the warm-up room and in the and in the very back of the warm-up room there was a tall pipe and drape and then on either side it was like the ones to your hips and i look over to my right and this dude comes around the curtain with his with his wife or his girlfriend and i looked at him and it was kind of like dude i know that guy like i know you and he like looked at my eyes like and i was like i gave him the look like i think i know you and he was like i don't know you but anyway, it was it was fucking Rob Van Dam, the mm -hmm. wrestler. Yeah. And I was like, Rob Van, Rob Van Dam, mm -hmm. you know, like, hey, hey, man, I'm a big fan. Watched mm -hmm. you a lot growing up. Super, and I just started shooting shit with him there. And I was like, man, can I get a picture? I was like, I'm a big fan. You know, I watched wrestling growing up, ECW, WCW, WWE, all that stuff. And uh, he's like, yeah, man, that's cool, dude. You know, mm -hmm. I'm like, dude, this is so cool. So then I, I turn around and start getting a picture, and he does the Rob Van Dam thing, and I about lost it. <laughs> I'm like, ah. <laughs> and uh, then the funny thing was is I thought that was it. You know, I was like, all right, man, cool. I met Rob Van Dam. And he goes, hey, hey, man, what, what is that? I'm like, are you asking me a question, sir? Like, <laughs> like, so he starts asking me about, like, what's on the bar there? And I had, it was my last warm-up in the warm-up room. I had 880 or something on there. I was like, yeah, it's 880. Uh, I'm just going to take it down to a board, then I'm going to go out there and, and try another one. And he's like, man, that'd be awesome. I'm going to go out there and watch you. I was like, dude, sweet. Hell mm -hmm. yeah. So I finished the warm up and it had some zip on it because Rob Van Dam was watching me. <laughs> Every, it was so funny. I stood up and my buddy Drex, who always hands out to me, he's like, he's like, well, that one had some spunk on it. And I was like, we should get Rob Van Dam back here watching you more often. And I was mm -hmm. like, well, maybe that might help. So that was kind of cool. Rob Van Dam was back there watching me warm up and then. I walked out front and he's out there watching me and I with 925. I'm pretty sure that was the number. It was 35 or 25. I think it was 25. And, uh, they hand it to me. I'm like, hell yeah. You know, it felt great. It's coming down. I'm just like, it, it was kind of one of those ones where it, I, just, I just felt fine. It was the first day it didn't hurt. Mm -hmm. Was that to me? So I was warming up, like looking for it. Like, where did that? It's not hurting me. It's not hurting me. Cool. It was like calendar year to the day almost that it didn't hurt. It hurt all through training. Every time I put a bench shirt on and the day I got to the meet was the day it didn't hurt. And I was like, sweet. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was going down there and I'm just assessing it on the way down. Like, this doesn't hurt. This is great. This doesn't feel heavy press. And then like, it's kind of like when you haven't done something for like I was telling you earlier, I haven't touched my chest in a, since the meet last year. Yeah. I've just not been able to, I, my whole thing was, let me get to the meet and I'll take my chances there. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I can, I know I've always hit these numbers. You know, these are numbers I've conquered. You've heard me talk about mm -hmm. that. I just know I got them. Um, so on a bad day, I should be able to at least do that. So that was kind of like my mentality. Um, like I said, I got the press call on it and then I go and I shove it up. Like it just come off my chest too fast. Mm -hmm. And then I quit pushing, you know, when you, when you something yeah. launches, you're like, yeah. And then you're like, no. Like, yeah. So I launched it up over my face and they caught it. And I was like, damn it. You know, like, 
fuck. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, damn it. Like I should have been able to do that. Like, and I'm sitting there, I go in the back, like, what do you want to do? I was like, I guess repeat it, you know, repeat. And I'm just sitting there like, can I still do this? Yeah. You know, then all the, 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 the little demon of doubt starts whispering here. Like you little pussy, look what mm -hmm. you've done. You can't do this. I'm like, so then, then the other ones over here telling me, you know, dude, you've done this a hundred times. You just screwed it up. You did these two things wrong. Like I said, you just need to, you just need to calm down. Not try to, not try to make it the fastest. Like Bob Coe would always tell me, he'd be like, you don't get an extra light for making it faster. He's like, how fast do you want this shit? You don't get an extra light for making the shit faster. Mm -hmm. You only get three. You only get three. You can't get four. There's no fabled fourth white light. So I was like, okay, I'll just settle down a little bit. So, you know, I was trying to make it fast for Rob Van Dam because I wanted him to be all impressed. And it didn't work. So I was like, okay, <laughs> now I got to win the meet. I got to get this. Or uh, I got two dudes behind me that can, you know, Ten Daniel Tenenergio. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, Daniel, if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, had a great day, dude. And he was coming up, and there was another guy. He was coming up. And um, so I was like, I've kind of felt a little bit of pressure. I was like, oh, I got to get this. or. You know, I'm not going to get my fancy nice belt and I won't get the nice fishing money mm -hmm. to go fishing with, <laughs> you know, like, so all these things are going through my head. Like, I got to do it. So I just said, fuck it, you know, re reset everything, went out there and just slowed it down, went down, pushed it up, like, just like a normal bench. Didn't feel hard. It just, just kind of felt like I was rusty at it a little bit. Have, you know, when you don't do something mm -hmm. for a while, you, like, I always know how to do it. Um. And I'd handled the numbers enough to make them not feel heavy, but it was like I in the areas like I really like as I get closer to the meat, I'm down. You know, I don't. I start like I tell. I work everything from the top down. Mm -hmm. So when I get closer to the meat, things ha things have to be at a certain distance, at a certain certain weeks out from the meat. That's just kind of how I've always been. And I kind of just pulled away from that a little bit because I couldn't. I couldn't just take those low ones. So I kind of saved it just to do it the meat. Mm -hmm. So the meat was going to be that workout for me where that's kind of how I was thinking. So um, I did that one pretty easy. And they asked me, like, what do you want? And uh, I was like, 975, because uh, 975 sets me up for 3,000. So my whole goal was set me up for 3,000, because 3,000 is hard to beat. Mm -hmm. um, I guess it would be hard to beat. But um, that's kind of like my thinking. Um, well, I called for 975. I went out there. Well, they handed it to me. It's the same type of thing. Didn't feel heavy. Uh, nothing hurt. I went down, heard a press call, and I started pushing it up. And I slowed that one down, too. So that one was, like, slower than I would have liked it to be, but I didn't want to lose it. Because, mm -hmm. dude, as soon as those – when you get shit to, like, three-quarters of the way up and it starts giving it back to you and you just kind of aren't patient and just don't – just you know, just stay under it and keep pushing – it, it'll want to travel people when the bench starts slowing down people want to try to make it keep moving rather than just kind of like riding the storm out mm -hmm. uh, so that was kind of what i was doing on that second one well i guess it would be my third i missed the first came back and got it on my second and then i took 975 on the third uh i went i remember i got it and i, I remember i boom boom i locked it out and it was kind of moving and i was waiting for the press call and then and, and then it started like sliding back and i remember i caught it with my like traps like like this and i was just like please please give me a rack call and i heard rack the uh, yeah i was like Phew. so i almost lost that one over my face too so mm -hmm. it was so. just it was a very rusty benching outing um people always ask me what happened to dave in the bench it's like well you know training's not you know shit happens and you got to work around stuff sometimes and that's just to, that meat was a workaround it wasn't i didn't train the bench i worked around it now, did you have the same time period between the squat and the bench as you had from the bench to the deadlift? It was a little shorter. So usually since you go from the squat to the bench, squat, you know, you have to get your squat gear off, your suit, your briefs, and put everything away, kind of calm down from it. It kind of seems to, you know, and people, st I don't, I don't, I, you know, usually it meets people bomb out here and there. So mm -hmm. the list gets a little shorter of people. Um, oh, sorry. Um. Go ahead so for the, basically leading into the deadlift warm-ups is where I'm going. Correct. Uh, so I think we had, it was about the same, like I said, same amount of time. It was maybe 20, 20, 25 minutes, something like that. And I'm already ready. Like, I don't fuck around with the deadlift. I'm just doing it to get out of the meat. Mm -hmm. um, I like, I like, don't like, so... <laughs> 
yeah, like I just, I'm like ready to go. Like I want to get this and get this, get this show on the road. Cause so I'm, what do your deadlift warm ups look like? Okay. So I remember I just start with three plates. Like I'm not taking a bar, a plate, two plates, three plates. You know what I mean? I'm just like, I don't got time for this. I'm already warm. I've benched, I've squatted. Let's just do the damn thing. So I remember I went like three plates, four plates, five plates. And uh, I put my, I put a pair of briefs on. I wear a single ply pair of briefs and they were tight. They were so tight. And I'm like, can somebody please read the size to me again? Like, they're like, no, those are yours. So I was like, oh, good. Cause I thought I got yours. Like, <laughs> uh, so I got my briefs on. It took like 500. Uh, then I put my single ply suit on adjustable straps and that was tight. And I'm just like, man, like everything's tight today. Uh, and then I think I did six plates, seven plates. So I went like 585, 675. And then I went out and opened with 766. And how'd that go? So it was, it was, it was fine. Like it, it I, so the deadlift training in this one, I was going to ride the deadlift. I had to go, I had to ride the deadlift cause I knew the bench mm -hmm. well, was going to be good enough to win, but I'm not going to, I didn't have those 10 fifties. They're there still. Like, uh, I, things were starting to come back to normal. They're there, but that day they just weren't. And I was just, and, I, and I'm not going to be stupid. I'm going to play my cards and get the most I can wherever I can. So, like I said, I opened with 766, uh, went out there and did that fine. Just stood right up with it. And during training, um, where I told you, like I had started lifting heavier, more often earlier. Sometimes I, I I'll do a lot of work and then I lift heavy ish and then it's heavier going into the meat. I just kind of pulled back and was like heavy, heavy, heavy. And one of the big things I did was work on my grip. I mean, me and my guys, it's a lot. Some of my guys, every, like some of my dudes, they were like, we were dropping deadlifts. It's like, well, uh, how do we not drop deadlifts? We do a bunch of grip work, you know? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I was doing grip holds, there's grip machines. I was doing plate pinches, dumbbell holds. I was just doing everything I could for my grip. Uh, Cause I needed to hold on to a big one uh, to, to get where I wanted to get a PR total, yeah. I should say. So I opened with 766. I did that real easy. And I went 804 on a second because that totaled 3058. I knew that would put uh, second and third out of question. Like no mm -hmm. one's going to like, the guy in second would have, would have had to pull like 825 at, at 220 to like come come close. Mm -hmm. And it still wasn't enough. So I I looked at like he was he was close enough to where I was like, you know what? Like I don't want to take a jump and then him and I miss it or something. And then he come back and just make a smaller jump and edge me out. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to put it out of, out of reach from I just wanted to win the meet. So second deadlift, I'm like, let's just win this thing, put it away. And then I'll try something. So I went 804. I went out there, dude. I grabbed it and I felt real easy. Like, it, like I just pulled it right up. I was like, great, dude. That felt great. Like grip felt. And I tore, I tore this callus right here. And, uh, and I was like, God damn it. Uh, I remember I was sitting there looking at it and uh, Ilya was there. And he's like, do you want me to uh, put, uh... he's from Cypress. Mm -hmm. he's like, do you want me to put super glue on it? And I was like, yeah, if I can do it, you know. So he's squeezing like super glue in there and like shutting the callus and shit up and uh, spraying my hands with this. It's kind of like alcohol, like dries your hands out and yeah. you put chalk on it and you have this like super grip. And uh, I think that's kind of what tore the callus to begin with, but that's neither here or there. So I got super glue on it. I'm like, all right, we're going for it. And they're like, I'm like, what do I need for 3107? Because uh, that'd be a PR. My best is 3103. And I needed 854 for 3107. Uh, in the gym, like I had just started the training cycle and I was maybe six weeks in, I was, and I, and probably 12 or 13 weeks away from the meet, like way, way far away. And I pulled 850 or 86, I think it was 860 in the gym and I got 900. Like I, I like caught it on a, on a, on a whip and I lost it. So super early in this training cycle, my deadlift was super strong like and i think this goes back to the last time i was telling you where i went to power shack mm -hmm. and i was doing tons of back stuff my back just got like super fucking strong and i was it was like what the, like so everything kind of like changed i was real strong on those deadlifts early from all that other weird shit i was doing that's the only way i can describe it or like that's how that transpired mm -hmm. so uh um I called for 854. I pulled it. Like I said, I, I had, there was no doubt in my mind that I, I pulled it. I pulled it in the gym. I was like, dude, I can, I'm, I can do this. Um, it was either go for eight, 832, which is a PR, which I think I, I probably would have done, 
or go 854 for 3107. And it's like, well, I've already won the meet. I've already totaled the second highest total of all time to myself that I'm getting ready to try to break. Um, like I said, I won the meet. I got a PR in the squat where, you know, I already knew the bench wasn't going to be spectacular. So I was like, fuck it, we're going to try it. So I called for 854, man, and I went out there. And I don't know what the fuck happened, but I I set up normal, it was just like all the other ones. There was just nothing different. I remember I, I reached up, I grabbed the left, grabbed the right, and I picked my head up. I don't know how far it fucking went. To me, it felt like it just started to come off the ground. You know, when you grab a deadlift, you know, like, right, you just know. You're like, I'm good. I can, like, you pull it and it feels like it's fucking stapled to the ground, or you pull it and it feels like it's gone. And mm -hmm. to me, I grabbed it, it felt like it was gone. And it was like, as soon as I lifted my head up and started to get it, come off the ground uh i felt probably the single most loud loud the single most loudest audible pop in my leg never i've never felt it before and i jumped up like it was it, was, it felt like someone hit me with a whip like like it was like boom i could like kaboom i was like oh shit that's it i was like I thought the whole thing was gone. I thought I tore my, I thought I tore my hamstring from my ass cheek down to my, the back of my knee. I thought the whole thing was gone and I'm reaching back there and I'm going, Lord, it's like, if you, if you still want me to be here, do this, uh, it's going to have to be there. And I'm like feeling, I'm like, it still feels like it's there. And I run to the back and Fred Clary's there. He's a PT guy. And I pull, pull my dude. It felt like it was gone. Cause I, I tore in 2021, um, I got forward with a twelve sixty eight or something like that, and I had, and I I kind of wrote it down real. I rode the squat down too fast, and it basically caused three big pops in my left hamstring. I split the belly of my hamstring, mm -hmm. um, and I got a bruise on that one. So this one, it felt ten, it, it sounded felt ten times worse than that. And I thought, dude, right there and then, I thought it was it. I'm like that's it, no more powerlifting. I can't, I can't, I can't powerlift without a hamstring. I can't, you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like I can't, I can't squat thirteen hundred with no fucking hamstring. So I'm just in the back, like this is it, that's it. If, and and I'm just going like, if you want me to still do this, Lord, you're gonna have to keep make, make sure my hamstrings there. So like I said, they're they're pulling my shit off, and he's he's poking on it. He's like, it's still on the bone. I'm like, no shit, like no shit. So I'm feeling around back there, and there wasn't a hole in it. There wasn't, I don't, I don't know, dude. Um, what what uh what people were telling me is that you have a tendon that runs under, uh, your, from your glute mm -hmm. and your hamstring, and I think I rolled the tendon because I was getting real dry towards the end of uh the meat. I you know cramping's an issue, and I'm and I'm dry, and uh, gear was real tight. Uh, I usually don't deadlift in gear that tight at all, and uh, yeah, I think it, I think I just rolled that tendon and then when I put pressure on it, it, it popped over, didn't have it, never bruised, uh, nothing. It, it's still a little like, like if I sit on it kind of, it's still, it's still not all the way. I did something to it. I don't know if I tore fascia or if I jerked some fascia loose or pulled it, you know, like we yeah. just jerk it off the bone a little bit. Um, but yeah, so. I just kind of went for the went for the gusto with the old thirty one hundred, and it didn't happen. Yeah, so you ended up with a three thousand pound total, which was thirty fifty eight. With the third, so thirty fifty eight, so the fifth time over three thousand. So I've done a three thousand five, three thousand ten, three thousand fourteen. Uh, that was at an that was at a nationals. Um, I did a thirty twenty. A thirty fifty eight and a thirty one oh seven. So six. Six over three thousand. Yeah. So the cool thing about this meet, and uh I don't want to say like pat myself on the back or anything, but like I was there again. You go four years and you're not there. And this is where I was telling you of like we where we talked about those dudes that they they get in this time period of not having any success or yeah, going anywhere. And you're like, dude, if you just hold on. And that, that's that's the thing in the back of my brain. Just hold on, dude. Just keep holding on. And uh, I got to where a 3,100-pound total was in my hands again. And, like, that's that's like a – it's hard. Like, it's like yeah, yeah. when you're there and you actually can do it and it's in front of you and you can take it, you don't get them every time. It's just kind of how it is. Um, 
but I was happy because I got to it with no, in my mind, no bench press. I mean, you know, when I say mm -hmm. 975, that's a big bench press, but to me, it's not like, mm -hmm. to me, that's like what I should be opening with. I should be closer to 11. That's just how I, you know, uh, in a perfect world, uh, I had the start of the training cycle. I was wanting to bench like 1050. Um, I've got num like the 3200 is there. Like it's just, it, you know, I just have to set it up. Like I have to hit that 31, maybe hit another one and make a jump to it. It's going to take a 1300 pound squat. It's going to take a 1050 bench and it's going to take around an 850 deadlift to total 32. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I've done them all in the gym. I can do them. I know I can do them. It's just bringing it to the platform and having the day. And so it's a lot hard. Well, it's easier said than done, you know? Yeah. Well, it's what I try to tell a lot of lifters is <clears throat> you have to physically be able to total more than what you're actually going to total, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around. It's like you have in the engine. It's like you, you have you have the ability to go 200 miles an hour, but maybe you should only take this track at 160. Then it's like mm -hmm. you, you have uh, it gives you margin for error um, when you when you kind of pull back on some of that stuff. I. <laughs> I just try to not get too out, out. There's what you want to do and what you can do. And then there's like, then there's like what the day gives you. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I wanted to total 3,200, um, but it turned into totaling 3,100, um, which didn't happen. And really what happened was 3058. So then you, you just got to stop and look at everything like, okay, did I get a PR? Yes. I got a PR on the squat. Okay. What is 3058? 3058 is better than last year, 3020. We're making progress. So um, I guess it's you start to learn like what numbers equal what, what you need here, what you need in the squat. And, you know, I kind of learned it from Chuck a little bit because he was so squat and deadlift heavy. He just kind of would bench what he could. Mm -hmm. He sort of messed up. Um, so that's kind of the book, I, you know, I was taking out. I'm just going to go, just going to go get a big squat and then put it all in the deadlift and a lot of times you have your plan and it just never fucking works. You you get there and your your whole plan's out the window and you're just you're just try you're just shooting for stuff. Mm -hmm. But my plan and my you know it was good. I guess to me what I'm trying to say is it was really good to have a plan and the plan go give you. It's kind of like a coach putting you in a position to win the ball game. Like you know you got 30 seconds left in the game. You're down six points. You here. You you got the winning drive right here, and you you either go down and you win the game and score a touchdown, or you throw an interception. And I just happened to throw an interception. Well, you know, that's part of the game. Yeah, damn Ohio State yeah. game. <laughs> I need to take a bathroom break. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what, people that train out here. It's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash Table Talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund. No risk, money back guarantee. Head over to drinkelement.com backslash table talk. One of the best ways that you can support the podcast and your training is to join the crew. When you join the crew, you get an extra crew cast podcast every single month. <laughs> you also get access to our Discord, which has a training Q&A with Team Elite FTS members. You get form checks. You can upload any of your training footage and have your lifts diagnosed, sometimes within minutes by multiple people. Access to close to 30 different eBooks, training logs, and first sign up access to our weekly training retreats, uh, train your ass off, and other events that we do. Biggest takeaways from that though, what people enjoy the most and get the most out of is the training Q&A and the form checks as well as the extra podcast. 
Hey guys, I'm back in the gym with another limited edition apparel drop. This is the new Live Learn Pass On shirt. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our cambered grip American cable attachment. This attachment has four grips and it's cambered. So when you flip it, it actually becomes eight grips. And if you turn it upside down, there's actually 16. This is one of our most used cable attachments out in the gym. <clears throat> even got that full range of motion we got a second limited edition drop this month as well head over to elitefts.com pick up the shirt pick up the cable attachments and we'll see you next time all right so we'll jump back in with the wpo because this is what the sixth this is the okay so this is the sixth super finals that they have ran well the sixth that you've won correct okay this is my sixth belt Okay, so out of all these belts, which you, by the way, don't carry around, I ask you to bring these in just so people don't think that you like have them all in your truck. Yeah, I, I don't have them. And in when the you car. go when you go to the restaurant, you kind of lay them all out and hopefully get a free steak. Yeah, it didn't work. I tried it. <laughs> Longhorn did yeah. not approve of my belt. So out of all these, which one means the most to you? Well, the. Th they all have their own story, yeah, they, right? They all, they, each one of them has their own story. 2021 was probably my least glamorous WPO, so I don't particularly like love that belt because I, like, when I see 2021, I think, I almost blew my other hamstring off. I don't like, you know. But that kind of represented a meet uh, that I won that I shouldn't have won because I squatted like 1173, fucked my hamstring all up. I benched 1047. I remember I opened with it was a it was the first time I ever opened with a thousand in a full power meet. I was like I was like this doesn't happen, but I'll try it because I need it because I needed it because I knew I wasn't gonna pull nothing. So I had to like mm -hmm. basically push the whole bench forward. Open with a thousand eight, did it? I was like hell yeah. Then I went ten forty seven, dumped it on myself, and then I came back on a third and did ten forty seven. I think that's pretty hard to do. You know, mm -hmm. when you, when you you see them dudes, they dump something and that's just it. It's hard to dump one big one and come back and get it, dude. Mm -hmm. But so I guess that like 2021, it's nowhere near my favorite, but it, just since we're talking about, it, I'll tell you a story about it. But like just adver overcoming adversity, like doing what I know, doing what you had to do, mm -hmm. you know, pulling, pulling your nuts out and fucking letting it go. You just like, you're not like, you just, I just made a choice. I'm going to win or I'm going to lose. And I'm going to do everything I can to win. Like I said, I benched 1047 and I pulled 600 pounds. I remember my, I had to lower my opener from 771 down to 500, 501. And I remember I went out there and I couldn't even really bend over to grab it because my legs. So I kind of like was like a modified fucking sumo where mm -hmm. I didn't even know. It, it was terrible. I pulled it up and it felt like my leg was ripping off. Long story short, pulled 600. I think I totaled 28 something, 2820. One of the worst days I've ever had, but I won and I overcome. So. That one kind of has a little bit of a story to it. I would probably say the best one, my, the one that means the most to me is probably 2019. And it's somewhere over there. It's either that one or that one. But that was the one I totaled 3,100, 3,103. Um, that was the ESPN WPO. So it was the, the biggest stage powerlifting has ever been on, never been on ESPN, uh, it not, let alone for four hours, you know, we had a, we had a four and a half hour window on ESPN. Um, it was the biggest powerlifting meet of all time, in my opinion. Um, you had some of the strongest guys there. And uh, that was just shortly after I left West Side and all that stuff. So there was mm -hmm. a lot of there was a lot of like animosity. There was a lot of like, I'm going to show you, motherfucker, you, you mm -hmm. fucked up type thing. And I think that was kind of a cool thing with Louie. You always wanted to like show him up you know like okay well, we'll see um heard a lot of shit on that end about how i would perform at that meet because mm -hmm. i didn't have a b and c from west side barbell yeah and that that one right there was was the middle fingers like hey i don't need you i can do it without you and there i did it mm -hmm. so that meet was probably that bell is probably the most uh uh sentimental to me because uh, at the time, the world record was thirty fourteen, and I came and I just came up and put eighty something pounds on the all time world record at the biggest meet on ESPN. Yeah, uh, all the it, just all the things like it was. It had it had everything. It was everything. Everything. Anything that could be riding on that meet was riding on that meet. And like for me to pull the biggest day out in the most extreme 
circumstances, whether it be like personal circumstances with like West Side and Louie or whether it was uh, people people thinking I was done or washed up or I didn't have it anymore. That one really, that one's probably the most near and dear to my heart. That means the most. Probably after that one is probably the one I just won. Um, I think it part and parcel it's it's because it's the throwback belt. It's like the, the you know I've got I've gotten every WPO belt that that they've come up with has been pretty fucking sweet. But that one, you know, when I first saw the WPO, you saw those belts. You saw like Andy holding the belts, and you saw you know Chuck holding the belts, mm-hmm. and Franco and all those guys. And you saw, it and I was like, man, that's what I want. And it's like all these years later, there it is. You know what I mean? So that I would say nineteen twenty three. The three favorites are uh, 19, 22, and 23, because those are all 3,000-pound totals or more. Mm-hmm. So, you know, um, and then I, some, of those, some of those medals I got, one was uh, the Super, we did a semifinals at the Arnold one year. One of those medals represents that. That was cool, getting to compete at the Arnold. Um, we were supposed to be on ESPN for that one. That one's a kind of a funny story. If I think back to that... Uh, in 2020, we had the semifinals at the Arnold, and we were slated. ESPN was all slated to be there. They had all everything paid for, um, like the flights for the the cameramen, everything. And they kept trying to like get like, hey, Arnold Commission, we need we need to be able to pull the truck up here so we can run the wires mm-hmm. in the door. Long story short, the Arnold Commission was just acting weird we're like why they like couldn't get a straight it was just weird like you know like being weird avoidant not being clear on stuff and then you come to find out oh they're shutting the whole nation down because of covid so that's what happened there we couldn't get espn in there because they basically were like we nobody's gonna be here so mm-hmm. we found out like the day or two before that happened um so yeah that one of those and then um there was a bench bash we did in boca raton at red uh redcon one um, I don't know if that was near and dear to my heart, you know, but whatever. yeah, <laughs> Jimmy Cole, Jimmy Cole got me on that day, but I'd like, but I guess I was the only one wearing a bench press shirt. Yeah. But that's okay. Yeah. We'll try again. And when we spoke last time, your, your off season was different, you know, yeah, it was well, more bodybuilding shit, more hypertrophy stuff. So it was kind of like, I think I may have said this on the last one. <laughs> It's kind of, Louis taught me this. So, like, I always, you know, Louis's like always in my head. I always hear that old man's voice tell me, tell him, like, just coming over. You know, how I did the interjection from across the gym, you know, like, yeah, type shit. But, uh, it, he would always tell me something along the effect of if you're doing something and you're, and you're basically not going anywhere, you need to turn around and run the other direction. Like, if what you're doing, the the path you're taking is yielding no results and all you're doing is spinning your tires, which sometimes that's kind of like, it, it, I try to tell people like it takes sometimes years to figure that out. It took me three or four, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes it's like your body, it takes a year to get your body back right to where you can train again. Um, but that's basically the off season this time. I was like, I got to do something different. Like I'm not, I think a lot of the mistakes that I made that I learned from through some of these past WPO meets is where I would take a lot of time off because training was so grueling and it, and it was so, you know, you know, you know, everyone's got jobs and life stuff and, you know, that, that, you know, work has, you know, gets real busy for me and it, it gets hard to have the want to go to the gym and, and just make yourself even more tired. So I was like, man, I, I cannot take any time off like I did. I would t- I would sometimes take the whole winter off. Mm-hmm. Like I wouldn't I wouldn't even go to the gym until January because I just needed my my brain. I, and I think that was a way that I uh, kept or used to keep from getting burnt out. Um, I felt like if my mind went, my mind is my strongest thing. So if my mind goes, everything else is going to go behind it. Mm-hmm. So. Um, that's where I was like, I went back to reiterating what I was saying. I just had to, I just had, I just was like, what is completely different? What have I not been doing? And what I hadn't been doing for a while was going to like, uh, in this instance, a commercial, I, I just say commercial gym where they have a bunch of machines and mm-hmm. stuff that I can get on. Um, I was doing a lot of the, you know, heavy fives, heavy tempo stuff. And 
a lot of ton of back work and i think that really like you know always pulling on those machines i think like kind of brought my grip around and just gave me a different kind of strength it tied in a loose end somewhere i was beating i was beaten some way i was beating down a certain way for so long that it's sometimes it's hard to see what's actually not making you stronger there's things that like there's things that they make you strong but they don't make you stronger if that makes sense mm-hmm. like there's things that you do that'll 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 like make lifting heavier weights easier but they don't like push the one rep max up so i uh i just felt like i had to change everything in terms of uh just get away from the powerlifting approach i just took a bodybuilding approach i was like well i'm just going to try this and see if it works and if it doesn't work then and i gave myself uh like a window so if it didn't work i was like so i guess i should say it like this i i went through let's see february march april i did like three months so maybe it was april may it was march through march april may or something like that or april may june it was it was one of those three month stretches and uh, I really didn't go to the other gym. You know, I'd go in there and pull some deadlifts and um, lift heavy. But because uh, I was doing so much assistance work, it's like I had to come in there and just do all this assistance work. Everything mm-hmm. was just. And I kind of learned this from Scott Mendelson. Um, we would go to we would go to like North Hollywood Golds. We go to Venice Golds, and and you know what I'm thinking. You know, Scott's one of the best bench pressers in the world ever. And uh, I was like, what does this dude do? You know, like. Uh, really a lot of the stuff he did was he either wore a bench press shirt and did board presses or he was he'd go to like these these gyms and he would just max out on everything dude so he did like in my brain i'm like well you're doing max effort stuff but you're doing it on machines it's like i guess you're strong i said i look at yourself you know like it's obviously working mm-hmm. so i was like i'm gonna take that approach where you know it would just be like half stack, three quarters of the stack, full stack, and then just do it till I couldn't do it. Like sometimes stuff like that. When you first start, I'll tell anybody that even wants to try this. If you go from powerlifting and you go straight to a commercial gym and you're doing a lot of isolation movements, you will you will hurt. Dude, I couldn't. Uh, and that's a problem. It's like I was too strong to know what I was doing. You know what I mean? Like you can, you know, I can. You know, you could pull four or five plates on a on a lat row machine. You're mm-hmm. just pulling it, but then the next day you're like, my brachial radialis feel like they're about to blow off. I can't. Why you wake up in the morning like this? You know, you have to figure out how to like. Maybe I shouldn't train like that. You know, so as you as you as I was like rooting myself on that kind of training, I kind of figured out like, hey, you got to pace yourself a little bit when you do this kind of training, um, and just kind of fast forward like after that three month period i was like i went through like this testing phase where i'm gonna i was gonna find out real quick if what i if any of that worked Mm -hmm. and that's where i was telling you when we're talking about the deadlift where i we just i just put my deadlift suit on after just going in there and i went in there and i i pulled 855 or 860 and then i was like fuck it i'll try 900 and i put nine nine oh five or something like that on the bar and i tried to pull it and, and it was going i felt like i got I, i'll show you the video sometime but i got like past my knees and you can kind of see the bar whip a little bit and on the it was just enough to like just stop me and so i was like wow that that was uh noticeable um we will we will continue to do that so. yeah so how did that change when you started to get ready for this meet so basically what i did is um a lot of a lot of the training i kind of i kind of just left it and went into i didn't do, i didn't do like this i did one or the other i think when i think you just kind of like when you talk about going all in you just got to go all in and do this and then go all in and do that like i think when you start mixing all these things and you have a little bit of this a little bit of this a little bit of this you're just you're stuck at mediocre there's nothing that pushes anything mm-hmm. the reason I went to that to to Power Shack was to push, to push some kind of capacity. I don't I don't really know I don't know words I'm trying to do, but the way I'll describe it to you is I was trying to push. Push this up so when I came back to it, I was already I was starting at a higher place, than previous years, yeah. so I was in a lot better shape. So since I'm in this different kind of shape and like, um. 
I will just refer to it as being in better shape. When you do those kind of like reps, tons of reps, you're in, you're, you're in like, you're in a better, like you're in better shape in terms of like, uh, muscle endurance and stuff like that. So I had a lot of endurance. I had a lot of, uh, I was real pumped up. I, you know, I got, I think I put on a little bit of muscle through that. And, um, when I came back to like the whole powerlifting thing, it was like, I, I abandoned, I like, this is where I was talking about. I went back to like super basic rudimentary shit. And I rode the wave of those three months into the meet rather than see, I think, and, and this is something like Westside, Louie would just throw 30 things at the wall and whatever stuck you would do. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Uh, I was trying to do like, how can I say it? Um, when you start, when you go from doing a bunch of reps to lifting heavy, like I guess what I'm trying to say is, I just went all in on lifting heavy and left the reps behind. So I went back to the split of like a max effort Monday, a max effort Wednesday, you know, you're dynamic. Like my, I say dynamic lower, but to me, it's just a squat day. I have a squat and a, I have a squat and a deadlift day. The deadlift day isn't typically always max effort lower. I'm always like maxing out on a deadlift variation. Um, and I would literally just go in the gym and just lift heavy weights. So I'd work up, make big jumps, boom, 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 boom. Uh, maybe do a thing here or there, pull sled, maybe, uh, so a squat, a squat, I squat, for example, we do like a safety squat bar. Um, and I would do, I would do, I was, I was back in sets down, dude. I was in like five, six, seven sets of two type shit where I were, uh, see, this is where, um, I had been so, re I'll rewind to 2019 and something Louie told me, um. I had been doing doubles my entire life, you know, leading up into uh, whether it be, you know, eight sets, six, seven, eight, seven, six sets, you know what I mean? Eight sets, six sets, seven, or eight, seven, mm -hmm. six, or eight, eight, seven, you know, like, um, it was always doubles. And Louis was like, well, you're, you're too, you, you've done this forever. In a nutshell, your body's just too used to that. You need to do triples, but you're going to, you need to do the same workload. So. You know, eight sets of two is 16 reps, but six sets of three is 18. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, you're doing 18 reps, but it's at one's a triple and one's a double. So if you, I had gotten so rooted in that double and my firing mechanisms were so in doubles, I switched to these triples and it shot my squat straight up from like 1230 to 1270. And that's when in 19, I squatted the 1273. <coughs> so I stuck with that and I was like, I'm going to stick with these triples. And then it just slowly started like Peter and my squat out. Like, uh, like it wasn't, like it wasn't, I think there's something to a double, um, like, like it's hard to be fast and explosive on triples cause you're trying to save yourself for that third one. If you know, you only got one and then one more, it's like, you can pow, pow, you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. It's a little bit different. Um, so that like in the squats, like I really backed that kind of stuff down. I was doing like heavier weights, uh, less sets and less reps, but they were heavier. Um, I did that in the bench press, so, you know. When did you know what weight to stop at? A, a lot of the stuff I do is I always know, um, I always know, like, how strong I am. Like, I've trained enough to know, like, if I'm hitting these numbers, it usually means this. This this training cycle it was a little was a little different because... Um, I kind of had to go through the first like free squat and like assess. So for example, uh, to figure out if what I did was viable, I wouldn't really find out until I took a 1200 pound squat. Mm -hmm. So the first free squat I did, I squatted my opener and it was really easy. And I'm like, wow, that's weird. How am I, how am I so strong off of, you know, I've done these two things and they both have made these squats and I did this thing over here and it quit working. So I went back to this thing over here and it started working again. If that makes sense. And I'm kind of running around in a weird circle, but, um, yeah. So your timing wasn't disrupted on any of these things when you went back? No, I mean, um, no, it was, it's like, it's like, for me, I should say, and it, and it worked for everybody. Like a lot of, a lot of like, uh, like Tyler on our team, he went in there. That's the guy last year. He, he unracked a nine fourteen squat and it rolled and like snapped his sinus, excuse me, his spinous process off, you know, mm -hmm. 
put him on a stretcher and they thought he would never lift any weights again and he came back and we we basically he went through the whole power shack thing um what i noticed mostly is it, it really affected deadlifts everybody's grip strength was up and deadlifts were up and squats were up so usually they say if you're if you're deadlift strong usually your squat they complement mm-hmm. each other so if your squat's strong chances are your deadlift is probably okay and if your deadlift is strong chances are your squat's really strong especially so uh, we had, it wasn't just me doing it. I kind of guinea pigged my dudes before I always mm-hmm. do that. I'm like, oh, but try this. And then, so sometimes I'll put the, they'll go like three weeks before me. Sometimes I'll stagger them three weeks and I'll run them through something. And I'm like, Ooh, I ain't doing that. You know, like, Ooh, I'm going to do that. Look at what they're doing. So they started pulling big, heavy deadlifts. So I was like, all right. So we come around to a free squat after doing these doubles again. And everyone was just strong, and uh, everyone it, it was uh, mechanical, o- automatic. Like it was like it didn't, it didn't take, it didn't take all this thought and think. They, it comes second nature. It mm-hmm. almost, it almost made the. I try to say sometimes you have to get away from a certain. You have to get away from something to forget how to suck at it. Is that you know? It sounds fucked up. No, I get you, that. You have yeah, to like yeah, get yeah. You, when you develop bad habits or habits you don't even know that you have that are that are not that are affe- that are affecting things negatively that are like you got to get just get away from it um brain for it well that well that makes sense because if when you kind if, if if you've already ingrained how to do the thing yeah right but then you now have compiled shitty parts about how to do the thing than if you just quit doing it. Yeah. If it's really ingrained. All the stuff, all the shit that you really gain sticks. Yeah. And all the shit that don't matter falls off. Mm -hmm. So it kind of leaves that core of what you really are after you peel off all this shit. Like, so, like, so my, like, and this kind of is another way that I was thinking about this is like going to Power Shack made me forget that this hamstring was fucked up. Made me forget that, like, this was fucked up half the time, you know, like, Cause I was working out, I was training, but I wasn't hurting. I wasn't trying to protect something. You know what I mean? Like it's just different. And then, you know, you know, like when you tear a pe- if you've torn a pack mm-hmm. or blown your shoulder out or anything like that, you come back and you're you're easing into it. And then before you know it, this one can always push more than this one, and you're you're just going through this thing of trying to ease something back through, where. I just forgot about it. Like I forgot my hamstring was messed up. I forgot my shoulder was messed up. I I went back to squatting like in the most rudimentary way possible, meaning like uh I I I, I call it the minimalist approach, you know, I just did I find it easier to do less and get to the meat and know I can always do more than get there and I have done all this shit. Like, have I done everything I can do? It's like, no, and I don't on purpose. Mm-hmm. So I know that it's almost like I, I ride something to know what it will, what it will yield. And then it's like, wow, I yielded a thir- I yielded a 30, 58 total off of some of the most minimalist training I have ever done. But what it also did is this is the kicker. It's the kicker is it's almost like training is in these waves of like going back and forth. And like as it switches, boom! There's a meet there, and you have the day of all days, and then you kind of go back to this way, and then it's just all, it's all it's always moving. So it's like when it's moving one way, you have to add something in to kind of move it back the other way, and then make the thing happen. I know I'm just getting mm-hmm. people say I talk in platitudes, but I'm sorry. Um, uh, so it's moving, you know, and back and forth in ways, right? So you start training for this meet, is that, and because you're going to be stronger because there's less work. Correct. It's almost like how you would peak for the last few weeks before a meet. You pull shit out, more stuff come, you know, it comes up. But if you do that for too long, then you're going to lose work capacity. And you're not going to be correct. Able to so that's ex- that is exactly, and that's where I think while I was while I, while the whole hamstring thing down here happened. Um, I was, I had wrote it as absolutely far. Okay. So I did all this work in the very beginning of the training cycle. I rode that through the training cycle, lifting heavy weights. And towards the end, I was starting to fall out of, Mm -hmm. I was starting to come to, I don't want to say fall out of shape, but the, the, the point of diminishing return, like it only holds on for so long and it starts to fall off. And I just put the meat there. Uh, and that last deadlift, dude, it was like, boom, there it is. It's like, okay, I got to do more, you know, like, 
So there's sometimes where I'll get to a meet and this one in particular, I didn't do a ton, but just lift heavy weights. I didn't do a ton of accessories. I didn't do all this 20,000 sets of hypers and do this, you know, A, B, and C and uh, three main exercises. I just, I was very basic. It was like main exercise, one or two accessory movements on everything. I didn't mm -hmm. really, I didn't really go hard or crazy. Some of that was due to my shoulder, but um, yeah, moral of the story is I just had to forget how to hurt and then peel myself down to this base layer of what I am and then start it, start it, go back to the thing of powerlifting again. Yeah. So if you put this into training blocks, right, so... Now you're like in a recovery block, right? It's after the meet. So the, I call it the break. And, yeah. and usually the break always seems to go faster than what you want it to. It's like, you know what? I'll go to the, I'll come back to the gym. So like I, I went, I went down there. I took like a week off. Then I came in the second one and then, you know, I worked hard a couple of days and I got tired and I was like, well, I'll just go next week. And it's like, so like now I'm at the point where I'm just now starting to like really get back in and start training again. And I think you need time. Uh, to do that. So what's this recovery time look like? I mean, how long is it? So do you expect this to last? Another, another week, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's very, it's short. Uh, you have to, and I look at it like, uh, if I don't get back on the horse again, then you start all the stuff I did in March, April, May will, will be gone. Mm -hmm. Like for me to, take that whatever gain you call it gains mm -hmm. you gain something from all this so i don't lose that you lose that as time obviously you know and you know so for me it's i just for me it's just get back in there so first it's like get everybody back together you know get everybody in the group get the group back together everybody start doing stuff then once we get everybody in there then it's like as each week goes on, you just start putting more bricks on, and you start and you start uh, re requiring more. So, so uh, it slowly gets added back in. Yeah, right. So one way I <clears throat> I explain this to people is if you look at how many total repetitions that you've done, say from your last heavy squat, say fourteen days out, <clears throat> and through the week after the meet, because normally you don't do anything after the meet. It's probably 300 total reps, maybe. It, work reps, right? Yeah. Maybe. You know, you can't go back when you start training again and start doing 400 reps per training session. That's more work or it's more like volume. You're a, you have to understand, like, the reason you peak for a meet <laughs> is, like, is we're not working out at the meet. You know what I mean? Like, uh, Louis would always call it, uh, he would say, no, he'd say some crazy stuff like uh, delayed onset muscle transformation, or maybe not onset, it's delayed muscle transformation, where basically, um, that's why we do the three weeks out or the 21 days mm -hmm. out, you take your biggest squat, because it takes, your body goes through this funk of adjusting to what you did to it, uh, to give you output on the date that you want it. Yeah. So like... Uh, it's like a super compensation. So you hit Correct. it, right? So then you're recovered when you go into the meet. You yeah. Know, so, so then when you're going into the meet, you technically aren't in the, sh like you're not in the kind of shape you were 12 weeks out. Oh, exactly. You get what I'm saying? It's a different shape. It's like you're passing off one way and hanging it to the other. And then yeah. once you're out of the meet, you have to like go back to here and like start that back up. See, now I'm kind of in the spot where I'm wanting to go back to Power Shack now. So, like, that's mm -hmm. my that's my plan. I did this. I'm like, hell, yeah, we're doing that again. So, uh, so you're going to lay out the year basically the same way as last year. What what things do you think need to change to make that better than how it worked last um, year? Um, maybe a little bit less in in the in the commercial gym, honestly, and then as like in the middle rather than uh, maybe just for me. Um, rather, I kind of went from an abrupt switch from one to the other because mm -hmm. I, because I was kind of in the position of where I had to know, like, do I keep doing this or, cause I only have so much time to yeah. meet. So I'm kind of like against the clock a little bit. It's like, is this working? Yes. No. If it's working, we're going to roll with it. Okay. It's working. I'm going to roll with it. I've never done anything like this really before. So I got to find out. Uh, that's like where I was kind of trying to tell you, like sometimes, uh, it's better to just 
I, I ride a, a, the minimalist train a lot. So I know exactly what made what. Like there's these three or four things that just make like this will either make or break your squat. You're either going to be strong or weak. You know what I mean? You go to the meet, you're weak. Well, that didn't work, you know, so we're going to throw that out and put something else in there and add this, so to say, to mm-hmm. anything. Um, but, yeah, it's basically uh, I found out that um, it was almost like I went back to 1973 where they were just, like, lifting, like, Larry Pacifico, lifting mm-hmm. lifting heavy weights. A uh, guy will post some of his his training logs from like 1973 and he's benching like 600 pounds two days out from the meet. It's like, what are you doing? Like, mm-hmm. like what are you doing? Like, uh, well, yeah. So, so what you're going to add in would be a, what would traditionally just be called a transitional block between that hypertrophy. Yeah. Work. You, you got to have that because your, your, your muscle. Okay. So you were, you were in the shape to lift big, heavy weights, uh, that work, that 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 work that that little bit of work I did was enough to sustain that output. Uh, and sometimes, if you do too much work, it it'll pull away from the output because you're trying to recover from the work rather than the work complementing the end. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a really fine line. Like, so that's why I said sometimes it takes years to figure that out because you go through cycles and you're like, well, that didn't really work, and then you're like, well, it takes twelve weeks, thirteen weeks to go through another one. You know, you're going in four month blocks, you know, before you know it, a year's gone. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So you really have to, uh, I try not to overcomplicate stuff. Like it's, you got to know what's working and what's not working. If these things make you strong and like for my instance, like I've, if I'm starting to tweak something a little bit, you know, I need to do a little bit more work in the middle, you know, cause that, that, that all that shit I did in the beginning kind of fell off mm-hmm. to where I wasn't really benefiting from that uh endurance curve if you want yeah. to call it well you don't need to test to see if it works yes so then yeah so we're lifting weights we're not testing you know it's yeah. like there's like a, in that middle area there's uh you know like where i went from the commercial gym back to the powerlifting stuff um that's like test like okay we're gonna and then from the test you figure out okay in that test you establish numbers so like for example i was like all right i'm gonna hit i'm gonna try openers we're gonna see if what if what i did over here will at least warrant me openers like that i expect to do so that's where you're like where where, where do you start you that's you know i'm always thinking my my thing is like if i can't do openers i ain't going to the fucking meet Mm -hmm. so it's like okay well all right 1168 Okay, I squatted that. It felt great. Uh, felt, you know, just anytime you first free squat again, really the only, like, you're not going to really be making depth. Um, that's not important. You, it's really about just getting in the gear, feeling the pressure, and going through the motions of the squat. So your body, like, you're introducing your body to it again rather than p- putting it on and trying to squat a PR. It's like I kind of get to this area of, uh, like a starting point in the opener. Mm-hmm. So, um, I'm trying to think what I was trying to say, but for this last meet that you were training for with it being heavier across the board, how did that, were there less max effort exercises that you were rotating through? Well, that's the thing. Like, uh, or really, were there none? The, it's uh, the secret is man. The secret is, is there's really only five or six. Mm-hmm. And then of those five or six, you have four or five variations of those five or six. Yeah. So like for me, it's like, I've, I mean, I, I say it all the time. It's, it's basically like West side split stuff. Like, you know, floor press, board press, um, pin pulls, mat pulls, you know, um, and in this instance, I was, I was pulling kind of off in the bench press because of the shoulder, but yeah, it's, yeah. Those haven't had to change over the years. Um, like what? In, what do you? What, what well, as far as variations that you're using, they've just so the, what really changes is is the is the version of the variation. So, like like floor press, for example, like you might you might do a max effort straight weight, or like I remember at Westside, a lot of the stuff we did far out from the meet, you put three or four chains on the bar, you know, and you do triples. Um, um, then. Um, a lot of the times 
it just kind of depends um, what's hurting and what's not and what you can push. Because, like I said, in the bench, my variations were limited. Um, there were a lot of high stuff, away, stuff away from my chest. So, you know, I did a reverse band in there, here and there, and it kind of upset it. So I was always on boards. And then since I was always on boards, I had to change. Like, I had to do chains, bands, you know, from mm-hmm. different board heights. So it's not always a straight weight. So sometimes it would be straight weight. The board height would change. Sometimes it would be against a band. Uh, sometimes I'd change the bar. But there, it's always a board press, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, same thing with the four press. It would, you know, sometimes um, it would be three chains for, uh, like, I would, I call it Mac. Louis always yell at me. I call it a Max. It's not Max Effort. It's like, well, the Max Effort three. So rather than counting sets, I would just keep working up and doing triples against three chains until I couldn't do it. And then, you know, you'd pull, pull a chain off and do a burnout set, you know, stuff like that. And then, uh, you know, the squat stuff, the squat stuff was probably the most, uh, the most stuff that didn't change out of all of it. The squat's pretty, you know, you either box squat and you're free squat and typically don't use a lot of bands. I like this whole training cycle. Like I said, I squatted with that safety, squ- that yoke bar. Mm-hmm. I didn't, I didn't, and I free squatted with a straight bar. Um, but, um, we would change like very, you know, the intensities would change sometimes like, uh, the speed at which you'd push somebody out from under the bar, you know, like, all right, you're done, get out, get in, you know, like that would be like, typically something like that um, would be on those weak ones, you know, when the, when the bar weight's not high, but you have to have intensity output Mm -hmm. to, to get response. So I'm always about like cause and effect. Like if my body responds, that's good. So any kind of response is good um, in positive, like if I, if I can do something and then I feel it like, wow, I like that, you know, that feels better. It's like, then, you know, you keep, you kind of keep working that until, uh, I don't want to say ride it till the wheels fall off, yeah. but well, you, you'll know, right. Bar speed will slow down. Something's going to be indicative. Louis would always say like, um, a uh, law of accommodation. Um, he often used the, um, the analogy of a, of a boxer he would say like if you're a golden gloves boxing champion and we're boxing and you knock me out for three weeks straight um as soon as i knock you out like uh, the fourth week rolls around week one you knock me out week two you knock me out week three you knock me out or knock me down or maybe mm. knock me out, whatever you want to call it i'm sure if you got knocked out three weeks in a row you'd be pretty retarded oh yeah yeah we're, uh but the whole gist of it is like uh, by that fourth week, you're going to know that right hook's coming. You know what I mean? Uh, you're going to be like, I've been knocked out three weeks in a row. I'm probably going to duck now and throw a punch. Mm-hmm. You learn. Your your body acclimates. So Louie would say, once, you're, once, I, once I duck that punch and knock you out, I'm immediately getting worse. Like, meaning like you're either getting better or you're getting worse. And once your body acclimates to something, the stimulus stale, you, you, that, mm-hmm. the whole, the stimulus winds down and, it becomes less prevalent. So, so if it's a three week wave and you're talking on the squat, so the first week it's shorter rest, right? So you're pushing that. Correct. Then what's week two? Week two, you know, so, um, usually all my squats are the general West side, you know, 50, 55 and 60% of mm-hmm. your, of your one rep max straight bar squat. And I usually go off what I do in meets, not what I do in the gym, not what I want to squat. I always hear that. I want to squat a thousand. Mm-hmm. It's like, okay, but, and I think some of the problems with these percentages is some people, they're able to do the percentages of a thousand, but they might be a 925 squatter pushing themselves to do numbers that a thousand pound squatter would do, but all they do is overtrain themselves and it like doesn't push the, to lift, to push that number up, you have to lift the weight. Mm-hmm. Like I can Louis would always say reps don't equate to absolute strength. Um, you know, you can get strength endurance, you can, but, you know, doing three reps of 400 doesn't mean I'm going to bench 475. You know, I've seen people do two, you know, five reps with 455, but they can't bench 500 one time. Mm -hmm. So kind of bringing it back around to the squat on that second week. Uh, typically we move the bar weight up or I move and, and when we're further out from the meat, I, I bump tension up before bar weight. So when I'm way far out, the last thing I really need to do is just handle a bunch of heavy weight all the time. And, and then you have to like give yourself some room to grow. Um, 
so um like i said i would usually further out from the meat i'll use bands when mm-hmm. i get closer to the meat i can't use bands because put band shirt on and fuck shoulders all up um and i and i always find that bands kind of lock you in a position and uh they kind of can adversely affect the free squat. I would see that at Westside all the time. Uh, you'd see guys uh, squat 700 pounds in three bands, and they go to the meet and can't squat 1,000. You know what I mean? It's like, but that equals 1,200 at the mm-hmm. time. You know, it's like, so, um, so typically, like, in that second week, it's, and I should say the first couple waves of the starting of the training cycle are like that. So you get, you kind of like get the juices flowing, you get your body knows your, I think it, there's something to like kind of walking your body through what you want it to do and then asking more the next week. I think that's kind of an approach I have. Mm-hmm. I introduce it. Hey, this is what we're doing. Um, you may, when you're in those instances of where you're introducing things, it doesn't, it doesn't have to be heavy, but it has to be hard. And that's where. Well, we drop boxes. You know, if dudes are having problems making depth and meets, it's like, well, you're going to start on a lower box now because that box height obviously didn't didn't help you at the meet. So we're not going to start there. It's like little little things like that. Um, harder is lower, so we start lower. Mm-hmm. Uh, we start with more chains or bands and less bar weight, and the and the pace is faster. Okay. You know, and then it's like the passing thing. You, you know, you, you you the next week you maybe will keep the chains the same, uh, and add a little, and then go up uh to whatever it is five more percent on the bar. You know, and then the next week you might uh add just another chain and leave the bar weight the same, and you might add another set at the end. You know, instead of dude, I mean, towards the end there, I was doing like five sets of two. Like the shit, like, I'm like, I don't know how this is working. It was very odd. I was like, I've never done this and it equal that. Mm -hmm. It was just, so I don't know. I guess one thing I have to find out is if it's almost like I don't want to find out again, you know, it's Mm -hmm. like that worked, but like results not typical every time. So yeah, I guess I'm just, as I go and as I learn, um, I've learned that training is first and foremost assessing yourself. Like, where am I at? What's my health? And primarily training health is going to dictate training. So if you want, don't go into a training cycle. If you're not healthy, that'll, that's your, that's, that'll yeah. probably help you. Nobody has to do a meet, you know, the meet is today. I don't have a bicep, a tricep or a delt tendon or whatever. It's like, but I'm doing the meet. It's like, great. Nobody else, nobody will remember you in a year. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like if the, not that anybody, you know, not that like, yeah, you know, it's just, you know, what I'm trying to say yeah, it's like, yeah. you, yeah. there's no million dollar check in powerlifting, unfortunately. So with the squats and the speed work, it's always the straight bar. Um, no. So, um, Typically, the two bars that I'll use are the safety squat bar and the giant camera bar. So then how do you adjust your percentages? Because you can't base that upon your meat max. So the percentages of the dynamic squatting is based off what I did at the meat. Even so, with the specialty bars? That's all, yeah, yeah. So special, So everything is dictated off a of straight bar squat. Okay. So like um, if I squatted this training cycle, I was actually going a lot lower percentages for whatever reason. Done. I was squatting like percentages of like twelve fifty, mm-hmm. uh, because the last few training cycles I've been trying I've been trying to push a thirteen hundred pound squat. So I kind of fell into the that's what I want to squat. These are the percentages I could do them, but yet it did not yield a thirteen hundred pound squat. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So it's like, well, okay, I got to get back into this zone of where I'm moving weights with how they are supposed to move, meaning like fast and explosive. You get that explosive power back. I think once when shit gets too heavy, you can't build that that chuck zest you know Mm -hmm. where he like hits the switch and it's like a bomb goes off it's like you have to build stuff like that you have to set that stuff up um so yeah i got a little off track there well the question was going into the percentages with the specialty bars okay yeah so like um everything is based off a straight bar squat for me yes um it nothing i was so the reason I even really switched to a safety squat bar is because I felt like my deadlift and my like was like was didn't feel like I I just felt like it was going back I just felt like stagnant like I wasn't really getting any stronger and it wasn't feeling any easier but I could still pull the shit mm-hmm. you know and I was like well what the fuck sucks 
and nobody uses that. You go to West Side, that red bar, nobody want to use that bar. Mm -hmm. But we did, you know. So um, the hard thing. So I just went to the hard thing. It's really hard to squat with a safety squat bar. So when I originally went to it, my percentage numbers didn't match like a giant cambered bar. Like I could squat so much more on a giant cambered bar and it would match my my straight bar percentages. But the safety squat bar out of all the bars will put you really behind that. It's mm -hmm. a hard bar. You're going to be 40, 50 pounds off of what you do with any other bar. Um, my whole thing with that is I felt that it, Louis would always say that safety squat bar complements your deadlift. It just makes you such, it makes you brute strong, makes you brute strong, mm -hmm. you know, brute strong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so yeah, but basically my uh, box squatting percentages are straight off of like meat squats. So like the, was your best squat. And this is where it goes back to, you have to assess yourself. Like, um, do I go off my best squat or do I go off of what I did at the meet? You know what I mean? If you're trying to build back in, it's kind of like where you're at. If you're trying to build back into the PR and you've not had success and you're trying and you're trying and things aren't working out, you got to kind of like take the back end route, you know? Does that make sense? Yeah. How do you assess it when you're coming back from the, the hamstring, right? So you'll go into this, but... I think it's a little bit of the forget thing. Um when you always know your hamstrings hurt, or when you have an injury, you always know it's there. And when you go to the gym, you always know, you're always thinking like, what can I do so this doesn't hurt? Or what can I do? And sometimes I think that's counterproductive. I think mm -hmm. sometimes rest is the workout you just need to forget. Uh, so typically when I, like now, I just, I kind of go in and, and I kind of just look around and do what I want to do first. And then you start doing the things that you don't want to do. And usually by the time you get to the things you don't want to do, the hamstrings back around, mm -hmm. you get what I'm saying? So your speed work for your shoulder this last meet, how did you navigate that? So that was so that was more of like, do what I can do. Mm -hmm. Like I knew some, I was going to have good days. None of the days really ever felt great. You know, when I, I, I don't think I went above 275 for speed work, but, uh, you know, and I stayed more on the chains and the bands, you know. Uh, typically when, you, when you've pulled something or... Uh, you you have a tweak or something. Bands are not your friend. You know what I mean. Like if you like, I've always found at least for me that you know chains seem to have a less torque on you, and it makes it easier to do things like speed bench pressing. You know, so when I'm pushing off my chest, I don't have this band sitting there. It's more of a gradual release, and I can increase that difficulty by just adding a chain. You know mm -hmm. what I mean. So, um, like with a hamstring, it's 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 a lot of do what you can do the shoulder it's a lot of do what you can do and usually if you've taken a little bit of this is why i think that the time off is important uh it and i i say i keep saying it like you just learn to forget the bad things sometimes they're still there you know not, not everybody's the same but a lot of like me, dude mental mentality is so much of like of any kind of difficult sport like you if you you need to learn to if you tell your body to do something it's almost like i tell my body it's going to heal and it'll do it like you just have to believe it's like you 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 have to stare down shit that that i don't know that is against the odds sometimes and just you know believe you can pull through sometimes you just got to believe in yourself you know so how how have you how do you lean into the the mental aspects now where throughout the past you've had you know you know fuck you louie i'm gonna win this you know so you got that driving factor and then when you're at the top right you're not driving to beat the person ahead of you you know so you're in a different mental place than anybody else you know so how do you how do you navigate that um i think uh okay so like I, I'll just start talking and we'll just, we'll eventually end up somewhere. But, um, I would always like, do Chuck growing up, man. Chuck was like my idol. That's the, he was, he was the best out there. He was the, he was one of the best squatters and probably the best squatter in the world, um, pound for pound and, and how he was set up and what he had to work with. Um, how can I say it? Repeat the question real quick. Your mindset now Okay, you know. so I would watch Chuck. Sorry. Yeah, I would watch Chuck, and you know he'd go out there, and 
he'd be spitting at the bar going bullshit crazy kind of net and so and you know he'd get out there and follow the squat and you're like oh you know um and i thought that's how i had to be to lift those weights so i remember when i was younger you know i would just try to you know headbutt the bar you know go all crazy and use my adrenaline to lift the weight you know and that got me to some pretty good places and then as time goes on uh you realize that you got to kind of like not get out of your mind to lift some of the weights you're trying to lift for me in particular. Mm -hmm. So as time went on and the numbers got bigger, I couldn't just get out of my mind. And sometimes when you get to that mind, I was telling you about the fight or flight. Like I would, I would, I would hit a thing of ammonia and I would just go whack. I get under the bar, I'd lift it and I come back out and I would have such a massive adrenaline dump, I'd just pu start puking. And after you start puking, I'm puking up electrolytes, fluids, uh, you know, anything that, you know, keeps me from cramping, I'm now puking up, you know. And and it's the squat. And I'm like, great, now I have to bench and deadlift. And here I am, you know, just got on this emotional high and I've crashed. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think over the years, I've just kind of... And I was talking to you about this meet. Um, I really just took the Bruce Lee route rather than the Leonidas 300 Spartan route, you know, of just kind of like being very uh, in my own mind, not worrying about jazzing myself up, pacing myself to lift the weight, and then the next one. Um, I think sometimes people, they lose sight of that you have to do the whole meet and you have more than one attempt. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. So what drives you, though, right? Because there's six of these now, you know, so. That's a good question. I've never, you know, I don't know. I guess I've, I mean, to say that I want to be the greatest of all time or, or be considered in that conversation, that's, all, that's like a goal of mine. Um, if you're not like, it's cliche, you know, everyone's like, I want to be the best. It's like, mm -hmm. no, but I actually want to be the best. I want to prove it. And I want to put so much out in front of you that nobody can do it. I mean, seven is the number of completion and there's six there. So, uh, seven is the number of completion. What do you mean? I have no idea. <laughs> it just sounded cool. You know, <laughs> seven is the number of completion. Google it and you'll, I don't know, you know, seven is the number of completion, uh, completion. I've got six of them. So I know I can, I'm, I'm in it for at least one more. Um, you ask what drives me, um, winning, be, like d winning, being the best, proving people wrong, being here when they quit, being here when they come back, you know, like mm -hmm. there's dudes that have quit to five or six years ago and here they are coming back and you're like, Oh, I remember you from five years ago, you quit, you know, it's like, here I am still winning. You know, it's like, that, there's, so there's something like, I want to be the guy that's still here. Uh, I told myself I would never, I would, and I mean, I'm not that old, but you know, I don't have a ton of this. I don't have a ton of these left. You know, I'm not going to do this forever. I'm not, I'm not stupid. I know that it'll eventually come. There'll be an end sometime somewhere. Um, and my mentality was to leave a very big dent, you know, like, uh, I mean, I said it in the West side movie. Um, I, I was gonna. I'm going to make you remember my name. Like you, if you, if you look into anything with powerlifting, you're going to have to come across that somewhere. And so my mentality was to uh, litter the books so much you can't not find me. Mm -hmm. I, I, these are just things that I think about. Like, yeah. Um, I just want to make it impossible for the next guy. Like, I, I, I hate the cliche where people are like, records are borrowed, you know? I was like, yeah, you know, not, not the way, not mine. Like, mine are mine, and they're going to be mine and until I'm just not here and then somebody else can have them. Well, it's the reason I'm asking about the mindset is it's there. There's one aspect which is under the bar for the max weights, and I think sometimes people just get too lost in that and think that's all of it. But there's the other aspect of you still have to go do to the power shack. You still have to train a lot of times when you don't want to, 
you know, there's times you need to back off when you don't want to, you know, there's all these micro decisions that happen throughout the whole fucking year that kind of play into all that. And it's, that's where a lot of people quit. You know, they don't quit. Well, I guess you could say they can kind of quit at the meet, right? But they, most people quit in the off season. Yeah, because they did the meet. Like, I think we talked about this also. So people, sometimes people, they, they train, they do a training cycle to do a meet. I train. Like, that's what I do. Like, I'm I'm training. Like, I might take a break from training, but like... I don't, I don't train for a meet and then stop. I think that, I think that's where people lose any, that's where I was talking like the, some of that shit you gained. You, if you, if you, if you just do the meet and quit, you, you're, you put yourself back all that work and all that, all that time you put in to get any kind of gains is gone. And it's like juice ain't worth the squeeze, you know, like, so you got to keep going. And I guess some people, they don't want to keep going and it's hard to keep going. Um, well, your break from training that you take is intentional yeah. to be able to train. I, think I had to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had to, and it's like, it took me some time to like realize that that's what was required. Um, cause when I was at Westside a lot, and I think this was in my like early twenties, like 23, 24, dude, I would do four and five meets a year. Mm -hmm. I would, and I was totaling 2,900 in every single one of them, you know, like, and, and I remember people would ask me like, how the hell are you doing all these meets? And I was in great shape. I was young. I didn't have any injuries. You know, I had great help. Um, but yeah, you know, like you just. Oh, we do a, we do a meet on Saturday, then speed bench on Sunday. Yeah. Remember I got West side. <laughs> yeah. Like if you were not back, you would do that. You could have won the meet on Saturday. And if you were not there speed benching, or at least you could maybe get by with like not speed benching if you won the meet, but like you, you had to be there to help the dudes. You had to be mm -hmm. there to load plates and get everybody to get ready for their meet. So uh, I think um, that's something that people could take anything. Sometimes just the meat isn't the period the meat just lets you know what you got to do to to keep going you know what i'm saying what i did here is going to tell me what i'm going to do in 4 weeks you know like where where what changes what percentages change you know like okay this bar worked okay uh these things yielded these results i'm going to stick with this we're going to add a little bit of this i mean you hear me say it like mm -hmm. it's it's I hate, I, I hate to say it. It's so ba It's getting strong is so basic, but like the, the non-basic part of getting strong is when you hit a wall, you know what I mean? Like what, what pulls you, what pulls you out of the rut? What pull, what, what makes you break through? And sometimes it's just keeping, keeping your, keeping your head to the grindstone, so to say, you know, like, so this was like rewinding. This is what I was trying to say. Like I would do four and five meets a year, dude. And I would just bang, 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 bang. And then, uh, you know, you, you know, I'm down, I'm down. I do basically one meet a year now. It's just. Uh, do you think those four meets a year at that age was necessary? Well, I looked at it like, uh, it's what, it's what was possible. So like it was, you know, you know, at West side, we were always trying to change the board. So I looked at meets as like, uh, money. You know, I get Louis would pay me for any world record I broke. If I, uh, you know, he, he'd come up, you told 3,000, I'll give you three grand. It's like, all right, we're telling 3,000 today. You know what I mean? Just like, mm -hmm. you change that board, I'll give you $750. Any world record, I'll give you $750. Bench a thousand, I'll give you a thousand bucks. It's like he would, so I, there was a lot more incentive to do that stuff back then to keep going. Um, but yeah, I think there was something else I was getting to with that, but. Just the daily mindset is kind of what I was speaking about, you know, throughout that whole year, you know, kind of what drive, cause there's good and bad days too. Yeah. Right. So on those bad days, you know, you kind of talked about it a little bit in the meet, things didn't go as well as you expected. So you got the two voices kind of battling yeah. your head. Well, you have to decide which voice you're going to listen to. You, you made a good word. It's uh, auto regulate. Yeah. Um, that I've taken that I've taken that a lot, and I and I that's kind of always sits with me, and that's what I think I, I when I say do what you're able to do, that's like auto regulating. It's like if but how do you know when you're being a puss, and how do you know when you need to step up? Well, normally it's you have to look. It's like 
What did you do at the meet? Did you bomb out or did you win? Or did you, did, uh, my always thing is based on PRs. Did you go to the meet and get a PR? Did you walk away with something? And if you didn't, you're a pussy. You, mm -hmm. that, that's, you know what I mean? We need to rewind. And when you were being a bitch back here, you're, you need to stop being a, it's that, that's kind of like where my, everything I do is like based off of results. So what did, I, what was my result? And if, this is my result and I don't like it. What caused that? And I think back to that time where I should have done, you know, like you say, mm -hmm. how do you know when you're being a pussy? It's like, well, if I don't like that, maybe I should be a little tougher back there. You know what I mean? It's like you, you, it's all, it's you are the one to blame. You know what I mean? Like I'm the one to blame for not doing something. Like if I, if I didn't do enough, that's my fault. Like if I'm a pussy, your results are going to show it. You're going to, it's you, you, the proof's in the pudding. You know what I mm -hmm. mean? You're, if you are not getting PRs and you're not getting any better and you look back here and you're like, well, that hurt, you know, back there. And, you know, I, I cut it a little early. It's like, well, where it was everything just down where you, you know, all your supplements down, you know, was your eat, you lose all the body weight after the meat, you know, gear don't fit right. You know, it could be a list of shit. And sometimes you just, I'll give you an example. So in this, this last training squat cycle, my last squat workout, I, uh, I squatted, I had 1241 on the bar and I remember I went down, um, and I shifted re really bad, dude. I don't, and I did it at the meet too, which is weird. <coughs> I shifted really bad and I stood up and it wasn't easy, but it wasn't hard. And I was like, man, I was like, fuck. I was like, well, 1241, that's good enough. I was like, uh. And Kellen was beside me. She's like, are you going to take that? Are you going to take another one? Like, looking at me like, you should probably. Like, because when, when you get close to the meat, your body's only going to remember the last thing it did. You know what I'm saying? So if you lifted an open. This is what I get with people. Like, when you're three weeks out from the meat, you shouldn't just do your opener and then go to the meat and expect to squat a PR. Because your body's going to base uh, off of what you last took. So if it's not like a big max weight, your body's not going to give you that output come to meet. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's something that, at least for me, it's like that. And um, so I remember I took the 1241 and I was like, man, uh, and I was, and I was, and I was like, all right, uh, that's good for today. That's 1241. That's all I needed to meet. But you know what? Typically on that day, you need, you need to take another one. So that one is in the bag. You know what I mean? Usually. So what I'm trying to say is if I would have stopped at that 1241, uh, that 1278 might have not been there. Mm -hmm. You get what I'm saying? So my my mind on that was like, well, I could be a pussy. Because 1200, dude, I'm telling you what, when you're in a gym, uh, and it, it becomes redundant, you know, it, things are just like, and then 12, 1200 doesn't, isn't 1200 anymore. It's not like when somebody calls 1200 at a meet. I'm just walking up to 1200 and this thing man has mangled tons of people in powerlifting. Mm -hmm. They're like, they're like entities to me. Like this, th this weight has mangled many people. And if I don't pay attention and I am not mentally uh, sharp to this and I am not trying and I don't want to try, bad things can happen. That's how you get fucked up in training. You know what mm -hmm. I mean? So uh, that is the kind of situation that happened. I was like, man, that didn't feel very great. It felt a little out of sorts. Um, I could just stop here and I'll probably be fine for the meet. And the, 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 the word that came back was probably, I was like, probably isn't good enough. You know, like, okay, now fuck that. Let's go 12. I think I, I said 1278. So I took that. I, I, I didn't feel good that day. Like I was like, man, this is, I was like, everybody, you better stay close on this one. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I'm mm -hmm. just going to try it. And it was actually better than the, than the 1241. I was like, wow. Okay. That's great. So sometimes you have to just l let your nuts hang out. Fucking fuck it. Let's just do it. You know, like um, worst you can do is miss it. I guess it's a little different for me. The worst I can do is get crushed with 1200 pounds. Yeah. So there's a little bit that goes in it. Uh, a little bit more than me, and I have to really make a smart assessment of the situation and really ask myself, was that good enough? Um, because if it wasn't, it'll show, mm -hmm. you know, and, I, and I've lifted enough weight to know that that wasn't enough weight because I was, I was really, I wanted to go in here with a shot to squat 13, all right? And I knew 1241, that's not enough. I was like, well, 78, that's a lot closer. If that moves and judging, and I can judge speed, because a lot of times when you get into these big, big squats, like the smallest thing, 
will end you. All right. And I had a few things on that second and I was like, man, you know, all right, we'll just try it again. And you just have to trust and believe that you're strong, trust and believe in your training partners and the training that you've done. And low, like in this instance, it, it went really well. And if I hadn't taken it, I probably wouldn't have done I would have been more apprehensive at the meet. I wouldn't even have been thinking 13. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So there's things like that. I don't know if that helps. Yeah, no, no, that helps. More. That helps. Let's take a break to stretch our legs. And I got some questions here that you're going to like. Okay. So I have a list of questions oh, here. Right. So we're going to have some fun. I apologize now. in advance for my answers. That works. That works. Um, some of them are just going to be kind of stupid. Like, all right. all right. Have you ever shit yourself while training? It's kind of hard in gear because you have so much. You have so much. Yeah, I was I just thinking that. It's like, possible. Uh, so I, I think maybe a raw lifter might have more of a problem with this. But man, when you get those briefs on and you put that squat suit on, it really pinches the cheeks. So me personally, no. I uh, there has been a few scares where I was like, oh. Uh, but no, I've never actually shit myself. So how do uh, let me go over here then? How do you navigate once you have your briefs on and your suit on and you have to take a piss? You don't. <laughs> you navigate it after the squat. <laughs> so I've learned this one. Uh I'll I'll go piss and then I'll sit down. And then just before I put my briefs on, I'll go piss again. Cause you know, like it gets, it gets, you start getting antsy and no, here comes the piss train, you know, like when you get the pressure then on your stomach, but I'll tell you a poopy. Okay. I'm going to tell you a poopy story here. And this is a great one. Uh, so I ran a meet here. It was at the greater Columbus convention center and uh, a guy I trained with at West side, his name was Elliot bomb. Right. And uh, he would, (laughs) I think it was like a 700 pound deadlift. Right. Dude walks out there, picks it up, and he's pulling it real slow. <laughs> he's pulling it, and he's pulling it, and he gets to the top. And then all of a sudden, I see this. <laughs> I was like, oh, no. I, I thought he blew his back out. Mm-hmm. Like, it looked like when a disc goes, you just freeze. Ah, you know. So he, he instantly drops the deadlift, and then he looks over at me and jo- Joe Jester was there with me. And he looks over at Joe. And I'm like, dude, are you okay? And with the, the most the most concerning look on his face. He looks at me and goes, I pooped. <laughs> and he like shit his pants. So from there on, we, we dubbed Elliot the poopy puller. Mm-hmm. So that, that's about the only good poopy story. I think there was one where Gritter did it once, but I can't really remember that far back. It was a long time ago, but it happens less often than you think to us multiply guys. I would, the compression, I just can't see how it would have to po- Poop in the morning before you come to the meet. Right? Yeah, so the the next one would be if you could pick any movement. So you got the squat, bench, and deadlift to compete in. So you, you can remove one of those and replace it with any max effort movement. It can be a partial. It can be any max effort. It can be block pulls. Whatever that movement would be, what would be the movement that you would pull out? And then what would you replace it with? man i hate deadlifting but louis always says that deadlift is true test of strength you know mm-hmm. i don't know man that's a good question maybe we could pull the deadlift out and put a fucking leg press in there <laughs> you know leg press or hack squat machine i don't know hack squat fucking max out Max out on a leg press machine. Yeah, because you know, because if you what do they say, it, usually it's like half of what you can leg press is what you can squat. So if you yeah, some shit like that, yeah, squat, yeah, yeah, if you can leg yeah. press twelve hundred. You're around a six hundred pound squat. That was a weird question. I didn't. Uh, There's really no good answer for that because I don't. You know, I don't really know what I would replace anything with. If you were a dessert, what would you be? Ooh, <sighs> strawberry shortcake. Why? You know. Uh, you know, I'm sweet and savory, you know, <laughs> easy to look at. I don't know. I'm just joking. I don't know. I don't know, man. Strawberry. I, maybe it's just cause I like it. I like strawberry shortcake or you can go to the Schmidt sausage house and get you a, a, a peanut butter cream puff. That could be misconstrued. I don't want to be. No, but I know what you're, puff. I know what you're talking about though. And that's, that's. I only say that because I went through the other day and had a peanut butter cream. Yeah, it so it's great. just fresh on your mind. Yes, sir. 
All right. So <clears throat> sometimes it's what's in front. If you're in a low riding car and you're the passenger. Yes. But then they pull up and there's a curb there and you have to get out of the passenger side. How do you get window. out? Window. <laughs> Straight out the fucking window. If you got a sunroof, we're probably going out that. Yeah. So how would you navigate getting out the window? Feet first. You just got to stick your legs out and kind of sh- worm over on your little tummy and get out the get out the window. I go feet first. Yeah. Well, you know what I'm talking about though, because if you, I know you've been in that position, <sighs> and I highly doubt you went through the window. But you, do you? I know what I. I just ask them to like drive someplace else and <laughs> <laughs> get get away from the curb <laughs> so I can open this door. Well. You can still open the door. It's just now you're so much lower to the ground. You, you see what I'm saying? So we basically open the door and your feet are hitting pavement. Pretty much, yeah. I don't know. What's the question? How, how would you get out? Right? Because say you can grab the car door to grab that, but then the car, door, the car door comes towards you as you try to lift yourself out. Oh, man, these are confusing, really confusing, <laughs> simple questions that for some reason I can't answer. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I don't fucking know. Well, it's a, you, you haven't been in that situation for a long time. So I had to, when I read that one, I had to think back. Yeah. I'm, I'm right? sitting here thinking like, like, that, like, I remember that and it sucks, especially when you're over 300 <sighs> pounds, it's really fucking hard. So how do I get out? Like, I, I, well, out of normal cars, the first thing I start reaching for is those fucking handles, you know? Yeah. Or the handle up here. Hey, you know you're real big and fat and sassy when uh, you go get on the handle and you rip it off. I've done mm-hmm. that oh yeah, 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 like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Time to get out. Mm-hmm. Oh like, ah, shit, that didn't work. So then, how do you get up into a tall truck? Running jump. Yeah, and you ain't doing that, dude. I I can grab rim dog. <laughs> I'm serious. <laughs> I got some ups, dude. Yeah. I mean, if I if I could. Uh, if I think if I lost 35 pounds, I could slam dunk. No shit. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, like right now I can jump up and touch a fucking basketball rim and I'm 300 pounds. Mm-hmm. I think it's just from all the box squatting and the plyometrics. Yeah, yeah. I used to do tons of big bar. I'd jump on like 48 inch boxes and stuff at West Side. Yes. So we always did those ply. We jump. I remember Stafford, Chester, we'd always jump on the boxes with dumbbells yeah. in our hands. Yeah, yeah. So maybe that would come into play somehow. So when you jumped on the boxes with dumbbells in your hands, this is one thing I've always wondered because we never we had like just box jumps. <laughs> what do you do when you miss? You eat shit. What happens is is um, usually what happens is is something unsavory like your shins hit the nice corners of the wood, and normally the uh, dumbbells in your hand will weigh you down and sh- scrape you down the front of the box. And then sometimes you might slap your, I never really had a bad one. Usually I, I, I fucking hit it and go up over it or something. Mm-hmm. But if I had dumbbells, the first thing I was doing was letting them sons of bitches go. Yeah. I'm like, oh shit, get off me. You know, like, Do you think those helped you? I can't really say. I think it's just one of those things where we did it because people were strong. And we did it at the chance that it might make us stronger or more explosive. Which I think maybe back then it actually did help. You know, mm-hmm. I think a lot. When I think back, a lot of like coming up and training and stuff, and all the weird shit we did, I I really think that like that really tied me together to just do the big things that like now. Mm-hmm. Like it took it. I mean, I mean, I mean, I mean, like years of that kind of stuff. Like just years of weird shit, like jump plyometric jumping and. uh pull-ups weighted pull-ups and dips like just weird stuff you know like jimmy ritchie he wants you to do like the prison workouts you know we'd be mm-hmm. doing like this weighted dips and all kinds of weird stuff like just you know what were some of the things that when you first came in that bob co instilled in your brain that was different than what everybody else was doing there well like at that time i like i had come in just as you were like either mm-hmm. gone or or like you were on the way out and that was like where everyone was tearing pecs like everyone was tearing pecs and shoulders um dudes were just getting torn up um 
I think the big thing was when I first got there, dude, you not only were you not allowed to miss a workout, you were not like if you missed a weight, you put a plate on. And then no, it's like if you barely let me restate it. If you like barely floor pressed four oh five, those motherfuckers were putting quarters on. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, fifty pound jump. It's like, but I barely did that. I don't give a fuck, you know, do it. This is what's on there. Do it or don't. Mm-hmm. So like the whole herd mentality of everyone taking this jump, I think fucked a lot of people up. Yeah. Play quarter, play quarter, play quarter. Correct. And then kind of like when I got in there, it was uh form and technique was the first thing, you know. If it looks like shit, we're not going up. I, you know, one one good thing that I think Bob did for me was, um, I he never let me get in front of my skis, so to say. Um, he would always, um, his first and foremost thing was not getting me hurt because he he always told me he didn't want my dad to sue him. I don't want your fucking dad to sue me. You know, like I'm like I don't think he would sue you, but still, he was always scared of that for some reason. <laughs> But uh, he was his his big thing was form and technique, and once I started uh, breaking form and technique, it was time to stop. Rather than back in the day, you know, you would, um, you know, something you'd flare an elbow and it would be real hard, and then you would just make the next jump, and then on that jump was where you'd tear the pec or something. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So a lot of uh, from like when I first got there, because I kind of like came into the end of 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 like the style that you were in Mm -hmm. so i experienced it like my first like year there i was like we did all that and then it was like we started getting away from it because we kind of took the position of well we want to be here in a year you know what i mean like we want to we started setting ourselves up for the long haul Mm -hmm. rather than short term Mm -hmm. and i think uh at west side you get caught up in the short term real quick because you're you're expected to do numbers 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 and and we just the our approach was uh we're gonna we're, we're just gonna go five pounds at a time five and ten pounds at a time and if i do three or four meets a year that's 40 40 50 pounds and everything mm-hmm. so if i move my bench up 20 or 30 pounds i move my squat up 20 or 30 pounds and move my deadlift up there that's 100 pounds on your total in a year that's pretty good you know mm-hmm. um so that was kind of the the thing with bob like we we always set me so set like set myself up for success. He didn't. He never. I was never put behind the ball. You know. I never went into meets where I just didn't do a meet if I was if I tweak something. We didn't really unless it was like a big pro money meet. You know. If I had, you know there was a few times where, um, like the first time I totaled three thousand at two seventy five. Uh, I it was kind of the same thing. I didn't put it. I I. Uh, separated a rib on my chest in june at the at the nationals and the west side pro invitational was in uh august late august so i went something like 10 weeks without putting a shirt on and then just hoped it healed you mm-hmm. know so there was there was like times where we did push the issue but it was for the it was for the right reasons you know i just i didn't push it for a state meet i was at the big meet type yeah. thing. so yeah uh, a lot of it was leaving some in the tank you know we didn't overextend ourselves. Uh, we always, and a lot of it was, and there, there would be some, there, there would be some meets where those, those PRs were really hard and it, there was like stretches. I don't want to say stretches, but there was like clusters of time where things were really hard. Like PRs were really hard. And there wasn't a lot left in the tank. So you're like, okay, I don't have a lot left in the tank, but that was hard. It's like circle back around to train harder, you know what I mean? Do more, mm-hmm. you know, like that's where I was talking about earlier where uh, that's why I'm a real minimalist thing. So I can see what exactly works and what doesn't work. And I think I took that a lot from Bob. Like we just did what we had to do training optimally. I've mm-hmm. said that before doing exactly what you have to do. No more, no less. Um, do what you need to get the outcome that you are shooting for. Um, Cause like, 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 <laughs> There's no fourth white light. You only get three. You know, it's like mm-hmm. you only, yeah. All right. So, <clears throat> moving into psychedelics. All right. All right. So, bring it. What major revelations have you taken from that, from any of those experiences? We, as human beings, sir, are but a fart in the blip of the, we are, we are but a fart in the universe. Like, we are nothing. Like, how can I put this? 
you start realizing like when the fabric, like when the veil gets peeled back, you start seeing things for what they are. And you, you like, you see the world for what it is. Like you peel back all the, like the just technology you peel back and you start seeing like, uh, earth stars, you know, like you, you just, you, you start realizing that you're this little thing on some kind of cosmic body. And it's wild. You just, you realize, I guess what I'm trying to say is some, um, some instances like that, you, they call it the ego death where, um, you basically, so a mushroom experience, like sometimes like, like when there's, uh, Terrence McKenna, I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He, he's a big, big mushroom guy. And I've listened to a lot of his stuff and, uh, there are certain dosages of mushrooms that'll, um, get you to a certain level and they call their, uh, uh, they call a heroic dosage of mushrooms, like four grams or more. There was one time where I took like seven, seven or eight. And I can't, it's so hard to describe when you get, when you get like down that kind of a rabbit hole, but like, uh, you, it's almost like you feel a connection to the prime creator source. If that makes sense, like the things of the world, you don't see, uh, I think like, like I said, but uh, you're just a fart in the universe. You know what I mean? You're, you don't like nothing matters. Like <laughs> Nothing matters. You know, like this, what we are right now is like, you know, you're talking, you're on, you're on whatever we're on for 70 or 80 years, but what about that? What, what's after that? You know, you're, you know, it's like, you know, the, the et eternity is long, but there's eternity ahead of you and eternity behind you. You know, it's like, it's like, it's a wild thing. Have you ever come out of it and been, oh, like, this is what I need to do for my training? Yes. <laughs> Dude, no shit. Okay. All right. That, so that, that, I got to think how this went. Cause there's been a, few, man, they get, they get, they kind of bleed together sometimes. <laughs> You're like, whoa. Grr. But, um, this was before I, uh, this was like three months before I, let me think of September. This was in 2019 before I told the 3100. I went and I took a heroic uh, dosage of mushrooms. I took like seven or eight grams, and I went. We went out in the fucking woods, and uh, just everything just started melting. Um, and it's not. It's it's more like a, you feel energies. Like I was feeling the fabric of time space, uh, and the only way I can describe it is like. You go through this thing when you, when you're on mushrooms, people, people, they try to fight it. You know what I mean? You go through this thing of like trying like, I'm okay. I'm in control, you know? And that's the problem. That's your ego. Your ego's in control and you're trying to control where the, where the ship's going. And the ego death is where you just, that just Jesus take the wheel. Let's go. You know what I mean? And it just drives you. And w once that ego dies, it's like it, it peels back. You just see things for what they are. You see, you see the forest for the trees now. It's like, think you don't you don't see things the same way. Um, certain, it's like the mushroom gives you this download of something you can't audibly explain, but you understand it. You understand. You have this. It get, you get this understanding. And that's where I think like some of these like I I kind of encourage the mushrooms. You know, I think it's medicine. I don't think it's like a people that are looking for a psychedelic mushroom trip, be careful what you wish for because the mushroom will take you where you do not, like you can't, don't try to drive the ship. You know what I mean? Let it do its thing. Um, and I've learned that a lot. So um, I think psychedelics like uh, mushrooms, um, ayahuasca, uh, um, Spud, I'm sorry, but I'll say this a little bit. Spud, uh, uh, he was telling me he, he, he went to Peru. And he, and he, and he did a nice thing down there and he, he told me all about it. And it was a great, maybe someday you can hear about it, but, uh, it's life changing. It, it, it helps people. I think these things, I think, uh, in maybe in today's age, uh, with technology and the influence of electronics and other things, we, things like mushrooms, like peel that away and they, they connect you back to what you were before any other shit came around. It's like 
Wait, they, these are just some of my observations. Yeah, so what, what training ideas have come? Well, so I don't want to know if it was training ideas, but that's after I did that mushroom trip, like it was like I got the download for 3,100, all the numbers. Um, it was like, I can't, I can't really, exp the only thing I can explain is like, I got this download of understanding. Um, I need to, you need, it was like, not I, it was you, you need to do this, 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 and this, you need to do this, this, and this. And it was like, okay, I'm going to do these things and I'm not going to worry about these things. And, um, I can't really put my finger on like what those things mm -hmm. were, but I understood. And I think that's a weird, that's a cool thing about mushrooms. It's not, it's, it's, it, it's not always words. It's like, you just know, it's like a knowing like you, um, and once you pull back the ego and the ego, you get that ego death. You you're open to these other I don't want to call them downloads or, or um, um, revelations, so to say. Um, mushrooms for me were 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 like a like a serious thing. Like uh, I don't look at them as a as a like uh, like like drinking alcohol because they will humble the shit out of you. You hear people have bad mushroom trips and stuff. It's good. You have to you have to have the right mindset. You have to have the right. You have to like prepare yourself for it. It's like a wild ride, buddy. But I, I, I'll tell you what, um, they've come, they've seen uh, stuff where it helps with depression and like, uh, I don't want to say this wrong, but like re rewiring the brain, um, and stuff like that. Um, Have yeah. you ever had a bad trip? Oh my god. Um. Yes, <laughs> buddy. Oh, it's such a crazy story. Um. Dude, it can get intense. And the thing with mushrooms is, is you're on the ride and you can't turn it off. So sometimes you can get these in insane uh, feelings of dread. You're like, like something's attacking you. And then you, in that moment, it's like, okay, well, what, what's going on here? And it's almost like the mushroom is bringing uh, compartmentalized things that you have like compartmentalized in your, in yourself that you don't even know that it, like you could have this thing robbing your energy that you happened in your childhood and the mushroom like brings it forward and, to, and like forces you to deal with it. And sometimes when you don't want to deal with that thing and resolve it, you start having a bad trip and freaking out because you're like, well, I didn't really know you did. Well, what's, what's going on here. So I think mushrooms are like psychedelics are, mm -hmm. are, are really good for that stuff. They really bring they, anything that's masking a problem or anything that um, you're hiding from yourself almost like it, you will, it'll bring forth to you and you will it like forces you to resolve them. So I think in those, in at, the, at that specific time, like the, like after I, and then I told 3,100 after it, like I just, it just like rewired my brain. I thought differently. Uh, at that time, uh, I had a lot of resentment for Louie. Uh, with the whole West Side thing, uh, that'll be in the movie that's coming out. Um, but you'll kind of see like where my head was at, and like the things I was dealing with, and uh, the amount of anger and resentment I had, and how that was like adversely affecting me. And um, it was taken away from performance. So, you know, you can't run off hate, dude. Like that'll run you. Like you can you can run off of it, but dude, it it is a it, the road at the end of that is no good. Um, so there was things that I had to like let go there were things that i uh, had to resolve um in terms of like how i felt just for louis for example how i felt towards him and west side stuff like that um so they, they can be pretty personal you know like it can be pretty personal stuff and i know i just got off on a wild tangent some of that probably didn't make sense because it's really hard if you've never done it to try to uh explain your experience so every <sighs> Uh, advice don't try to control it um start off slow you know i would people always ask me uh, uh 3.5 grams of mushrooms is, will get you the ride that you want and anything more than that be careful what you wish for um it just there sometimes it can be real intense and it's a ride um but yeah but like i said i, I think uh one of the things that i noticed mostly is it the thing like at that instance before like that 3,100 pound total, I had all this uh, like resentment because of the whole West side thing. And uh, basically I felt that, you know, Louis had turned his back on me and uh, I felt, you know, I'd given my life for that place. And 
Uh, they kind of turned their back on me. That's just the way I felt, whether they meant it that way or not. That's how it was. And uh, that stuff will, if you that's that kind of thing will eat you, man. It'll get in there and it'll eat you. And before you know it, it robs your joy. And um, you can't let people or things rob you joy uh, because you'll you'll die miserable. You know, it'll it'll kill you. How would it be different than THC? Uh, I don't think THC. Um, THC, I think, is just a little different. It's not. It's you don't get. You don't really go psychedelic on it. You don't. You don't. You don't. Uh, I'm sure there's some strong THC products out there that'll make you a little loopy. But in terms of psychedelics, I don't think THC kind of classifies as a psychedelic. I kind of put that as medicine, also, like for. You know, when you, when you talk about THC, like, you know, there's different kinds, you know, you have your indicas and your sativas and your hybrids. And, you know, um, if you know, I mean, this day and age of, you know, everybody kind of, you know, there's dispensaries everywhere now. And, um, you know, if you have problems sleeping, you know, THC, uh, indica, heavy indicas or something that help you sleep. If, uh, um, you know, your daytime smokers or your sativas and stuff get stuff done. Sometimes they give you an energetic like feeling to it. Um, um, if you're trying to gain weight, there you go. People always like, how do you gain weight? It's like, well, you know, THC will help you with your cause, my boy, you know, like, it'll it'll get you there. But, um, I think, uh, they have their, they have their place, you know, um, mushrooms are kind of thing. I should say psychedelics, like mushrooms, ayahuasca, <laughs> buddy, be care- like you, you gotta, you have to have a mind, like, don't go in that, that kind of shit with, uh, you respect that's the kind of man it sounds it sounds kind of corny but if you don't think i'm right go eat four grams of mushrooms and then and then try to control that ride and tell me how it goes like it's uh can be bad how is because thc is recreational legal now in ohio so how is that going to change your life in any way uh, i mean I think anything in moderation, you know what I mean? I don't think it makes it just because it's, you know, what is it? Uh, narrow is the road, you know, just because you can have it in all these different ways doesn't mean you should have it all the ways you can get it. I know that was a weird saying, but um, I don't think it really changes a lot. Um, I think um, now that it's legal here and you have like dispensaries, you can go into there. I think those my whole thing about like dispensaries and i'll just get off on a tangent here is the shit's too expensive um if you want you got to get a medical card if you want like you know um medical price if you have a medical card they usually give you a better discount on you know prices and stuff but all in all um i just think the shit's overpriced for being in dispensaries um if you treat yeah Oh, yeah. How have, how or have you used that for recovery and training and so forth? I mean, yeah. So, like, I mean, it, you can actually. There's like science around this shit. You know, like, um, I'm not a scientist. Um, I'm more of a practical kind of person. If the proof is in the pudding, I'm going to use it. You know, um, for me, it's always been like it. It helps with inflammation. You know, like from like, and I could be way wrong, or at least it makes me feel like that. And if it makes me feel like that, then that's half the fucking struggle right there. Um, inflammation, um, anxiety. Like I don't have anxiety, but it always, you know, even keel kind of keeps you on target. Um, people like Adderall. I don't like that shit. You know what I mean? Like I'm actually ADD and like Adderall and shit makes me a zombie. Mm-hmm. Like I'll just, like it doesn't <laughs> speed me up at all. So you actually have can, can, cannabinoid receptor. Now, I don't know if I'm saying that right. You guys can fact check me. Uh, but you have uh, cannabinoid receptors in your brain. So your body is actually hardwired to process cannabis and uh, THC. Um, then there's different kinds. Like, I know I, I might be butchering this, but there's, when you, dude, when you decarboxylate THC, it becomes like, it like drops something or adds something. It becomes THCA or something like that. And when you eat it and it goes through your liver, it, 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 that's like psychedelic shit. I do. I'm not one for edibles, buddy. You cannot turn that stuff off. You're on a four hour, like you're on a four hour ride <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's heavy. So I think, uh, lots of good uses for THC and, um, flower medicine. Um, I noticed a lot with cancer patients, um, when they uh when they're taking chemo 
and um, they don't have an appetite or they feel nauseous from the, the medication, things like THC and, and flour and uh, concentrates and stuff like that really um, alleviate their um, nausea, gives them an appetite when they're in this wasting mode. Um, and I kind of like, it's the same thing. Like, you know, when you're, when you're training and you're tired and you need to unwind, the last thing I'm doing is reaching for a bottle of whiskey or alcohol. You know what I mean? Alcohol drives me out. I think it's one of the worst things. Like when I see people drinking whiskey to deadlift, I'm like, oh, like, no, nah, I'd never do that. Um, I think, I think, I think like alcohol is really bad for training and it's really bad for any kind of like, and don't get me wrong. I like drinking beers. You know what I mean? I like going, you know, having a beer, drinking some shots, whatever. But like, in terms of like, like, that's the thing I go to, you know, like Matt Demo, we'll give him as an example. Dude, you do drink a case of beer like every night, you know, and show up at the gym and smell like, you know, mm -hmm. like a French whorehouse. You know, it's like, you know, back then that dude, 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 dude alcohol fueled stone cold, you know, it's like, I ain't like that no more. Mm -hmm. you know, it's like, so my whole thing is I've always, alcohol's always hurt me. You know, it's always dried me out. Never makes me feel good. No one likes being hung over, dude. You know, like you get up the next morning, it takes you six hours just to get right, you know, from being shit faced. And, you know, so I was kind of always one that went, went the, you know, THC route, um, whether it be, you know, after training, you know, have a little bit and get, get your meal and go to bed, you're, you're relaxed, um, kind of just unwind you, you know, you're not stressed. People, people go have a cigarette to, you know, they smoke to get, you know, you know, people are stressed out. They have to go have a cigarette, you know, just take a couple hits of a bowl. Yeah. And that's the thing, like. Um, people, some people, they ask me like, what's, what's the best way to start? And I say a porcelain one hitter, that way you can control the ride. You know what I mean? So, you know, anything in moderation, you can always take more. The <clears throat> switching topics. The one thing that <clears throat> I've been trying to explain to lifters that get in the sport or say they've been in the sport for three or four years is <clears throat> When you're in the sport for a long time, you've been in the sport for a long time, been training for a long time, you know, training partners are crucial. They're important. You know, training crews, I think, are very important. But something else that kind of gets lost in that conversation is if you're going to do this for a long period of time, your training partners are going to change. Your crews are going to change. It's just part of the process. And if you I think if you already kind of know ahead of time, those people aren't going to stay most of the time, you know, they're going to kind of fade away, then you won't get as caught up in the drama that's associated with the groups, the training partners, the crews, or even the federations, because over a period of time, the people who are creating the drama, they're just not going to be there. Correct. But at the same time, you don't want to have over-reliance on the people that are in the crew or your training partners, because when they leave, which they inevitably will do if you stay on this journey. Yep. You don't want to be fucked. You know, high so, turnover rate. Yeah. So how would you? So I, the, I'll talk about my team for a little bit because um, I always I always come on here and tell you like I I probably got the best group of guys and girls around me. Um, they the the same synergy like when we when we left Westside, uh, they're all still there with me. Mm -hmm. Like the, here we are, what, six, six years later, and I still have the same core groups, you know, like Alex and Snooky and Anthony, he moved to mm -hmm. um, New Hampshire, but we're, we're still all on the same page. You know, he, you know, we kind of uh, still get, get everything in the same page in terms of training. He's like, Hey, I'm doing this this week. You know, do we do this or should we do that? And then we, you know, Hey, do this or do that. And he goes and makes his decision on what he thinks. But um, in terms of like people, um, I've had the same group of like five, I have like a synergy of like five guys and they've, they've been around since, uh, we left and even at Westside, dude, these are the same dudes there. So, so like half of them spilled over from when I was there. So they, they just came with me mm -hmm. and then we added some people, you know, and there's only one guy that is that, that has, that joined the night crew that isn't there anymore. Um, and he quit maybe back in. Uh, maybe 2020 is when he when he quit 
but he was, you know, that's one. So I guess the point I'm making is you really have to vet the people that you put around you. Um, uh, I, I, it's like, again, you'll hear me say, you keep using the word cliche, but would I trust this person in a, in a foxhole? You know, if bullets are coming and it sounds stupid to say, but like, those are the kind of trust you have to, you, that's the kind of dependability you need to have. Um, I'll give you an example. There's a guy named Jeff McDowell on my team. He, uh, he's been with us since day one and, um, he just had, he just, he just got cancer. So he's been dealing with, uh, about with cancer and, um, he's been, uh, he just got out of his, um, he just went through an, uh, an intravenous treatment. I don't, I don't think it was chemo, but whatever the cancer treatment was, um, this dude is in a bad way. You know, he's, uh, and you know what that guy did? He fucking drove his ass down to Florida and was, uh, loading my plates, uh, wrapping my knees, getting, getting stuff I needed. Um, like, so, you know, I got a dude that's, that's fighting cancer that drops everything and says, where do you need me? You know what I mean? I got, you know, Drex, Drex, you know, he doesn't even, he, he, he lives in Southern Ohio. He, he, you know, he's, he's nowhere near here. That dude drives up an hour and a half to hand out to me. I'm like, dude, I need you. Can you come? I try to ask him. I'm like, I need you on this day. Like I try to give him a heads up. Mm -hmm. like, Hey man, um, I'm going to put my shirt on. Can you make it this day? And if he says yes, or I'll, you know, I'll move it if he can't. But, um, you know, I got, I got dudes like that, you know, like, uh, so they're really hard to come by and you have to, and some of them and the ones that you bring in, you have to, you have to really hold their feet to the fire and be like, look, you see these dudes here. This is what's required of you. Like, this is what is required of you. This guy has cancer and he came down and handed weights out to you and then drove and then drove 14 and a half hours back home and got another cancer treatment. You know what I mean? So some, um, I think a lot of people, they, they get in this thing of where there's a guy that, that power lifts over there and a guy that power lifts over there. And maybe we should all power lift together, you know? And sometimes that's just not the, cause you might have a cancer in there that that's all about them. And then they, they bring drama, strife, division. And before you know it, you got this guy talking shit about how he doesn't like this main exercise. And then just, and then it comes back around to me or something like that. And it's like, Hey, you know what, if you don't like it, then you can get the fuck out of here. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't care what you like. I don't, I don't, I've been here 20, I've been doing this 20 years. I don't have to ask you what you like. You know, these things make you strong. If you don't like them, don't fucking do them. Like the, it's like, so a lot of my guys are, uh, I don't want to say all of them, all of them. They're all great men. They're men. They're not fucking boys. And that's another thing. There's a lot of fucking boys out there and there ain't men that act like men. So, uh, the men in my group, we all have each other's backs. We're all there for each other. We all, it's, and it's been built over time. So like, it's almost like almost maybe the opposite as time goes on, we we get closer and stronger. And, um, I not not just looking back, you know, like when it when you know when it all kind of came together there when we left Westside, or we got kicked out, whatever the fuck you want to call it. Um, uh, we all just kind of rallied around each other, and we're just like, we're gonna do this and fuck everyone else, and and here we are, six seven years later, still doing the same thing. And not only are we further, it's like when you, I guess the thing I say, I look back and I'm like, am I in the same spot as I was six years ago? Am I spinning tires or, or, you know, have I made these guys better? Have these guys made me better? And the answer is yes. Those guys are getting stronger. They're doing what it takes. Um, like my guys, like we, pay, like we don't have to, like if somebody needs something, like if someone's in need, like we're all there for each other. Like if uh, some guy uh, is having relationship problems and he's got to move, it's like, let's go move him and get him to where he's got to go. So we can get him back on track. So his head's where it needs to be. Um, you need more from a training partner. It's not just powerlifting, dude. It's life. These people, you life with these people and um, you're around them a lot and you have to, you have to put trust in them. And I know I just kind of went off mm -hmm. on a tangent, but I'm, I'm super, I'm super blessed. I think the Lord has put people like this around me because there's no way that I can continue. There's just no way, dude. Like I, I, to, to do some of the things that I've done one time is hard. And then to come back around and then try to do them again and then to keep doing them. And then you keep asking the, you keep asking people like, Hey, I need you to, it's just, I don't know.
it's it's just something to say like who is around you, you, you that's who you're going to be you will become the people you're around so you're either going to elevate to a level or you're going to you're going to you're going to like lower yourself down to somewhere you never stay the same you're either getting better or you're getting worse um so um i've always just tried to make it a point to have people around me that only elevate me you know they say if you want to be a millionaire you better start hanging around a bunch of millionaires you know what i mean the, 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 by, by osmosis one day you might figure out how to make a million dollars you mm-hmm. know it's the same thing um if uh, i get these guys around me um i act the way i'm supposed to act and i and i and i lead by example what i expect from them and i hold them to the standard that i put out so if i'm not putting out something and i i shouldn't you know I shouldn't yell at them for not. You get what I'm saying? It all yeah. starts with me. And that's, yeah. that's the kind of thing. I'm, I'm a real, uh, what's the word? I'm my own, a self-critic, you know. Um, I'm, I'm going to look at myself first before I start looking, pointing fingers. Because a lot of the time, uh, the problem starts, you know, here. Mm-hmm. You know, and if and if you can get in that mindset of like maybe it's not out there, it's here, and if I fix here first, I'll project the things that I want, and that'll attract the people that I need, and then once those people come in, uh, they then lift you up to a spot that you couldn't have been before. So I think that's kind of like the story of my group. It's still growing. It's getting bigger. You know, it's I didn't think it would. I didn't, dude. I just didn't think I'd be sick. Like I said, six years later and I, and it's still growing. So, um, yeah. What's the update on the documentary? That's I'm, I'm so glad that you asked. Um, so I talked to Michael, I went to Tallahassee and, um, we did, Oh, when was this? I think it was in July. It was hotter than fuck, dude. I was wearing the uh, humidity down there. I, uh, I, I love you, Michael, but my goodness, that Tallahassee weather I did not like. Um, we went down there and we, uh, I did a, um, a photo shoot for some products that he had. And then, uh, um, we did the last interview. So I did my final interview for the movie and, uh, that was, I don't know, a few months ago, three or four months, three months ago. And I, I talked to him the other day and I asked him, I was like, Hey man, I'm going on here. Do you want me to say anything? He's like, he's like, well, uh, it's still being edited. The beginning is done. The end is done. And the, all the editing right now is in the middle. Um, there is a title for it. Uh, I'll tell you after it. I don't know if I'm supposed to say it yet, but there is a title, um, to it there. I asked him, uh, when he thought a release would be, he said tentatively he is shooting for late spring. So maybe around April, May is when you might be able to start seeing screenings. It's going to come out on Netflix. It'll be on Amazon, just like West Side Rooster mm-hmm. World. So all that stuff's still in play. Um, we're going to have a theatrical release here in, in Columbus. So anytime, like, remember for mm-hmm. West Side Rooster mm-hmm. World, same thing. So all that stuff's coming down the pipe. West Side versus the World took about five and a half years, and everyone from the beginning until the end said, uh, I thought this was going to be done, Dirk and yeah, You know, yeah. it's like, it's like, man, documentaries aren't like, aren't like making a Marvel movie. You know, you don't have like a, you don't have a budget, and then six months later or three months later, you got a movie. You know, it's like, doesn't work like that. It, it, it's really highly dependent on uh, storylines. So you start a movie out the, uh, with storylines, and you have an idea of what you want to do, and then your storylines start taking shits, mm-hmm. you know, i.e., people that were supposed to do things that didn't do things. So, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm a, this good person. Film me. It's like, okay, start filming you. And then you eat shit and crash. It's like, well, that didn't help the movie Mm -hmm. on to the next thing, you know? So then the movie kind of changes and, uh, your focus gets redirected and that's kind of, it happens. It happens with Wes. It happened with every single one. Mm -hmm. So like when we started West side versus the world or Michael did, I should say, um, it kind of started off a certain way. And then as it got middle way through, you realize that another story presented itself. Like in this instance, the Chuck thing, when mm-hmm. Chuck came back to West side, like that wasn't ever planned. He just came back and we're like, that's a story. Like he's here now. Like, so like that got into the movie. So like, there's things that happen along the way. And even when the movie's done, so like he, he, the movie, he said he has it down to like an hour and 40 minutes. And, uh, like, two years like maybe last year it was three or four hours you know and it gets down to like shaving 
shaving unnecessary talking out and then he's got to then there has to be a um the editing part is really what what is a lot because you get you get down in the editing and then you look back and you're like oh i gotta i gotta tell this and then he's got to go back and then put something in that explains that helps mm-hmm. articulate something and it's just a process so it's getting done it's almost there um like I said, West Side versus the World was about five and a half years, and we're about that on this one. Mm-hmm. So it's coming. Um, it's cool. Yeah, I, I, I said, hey man, I said, this thing's got to be good, right? He's like, he's like, oh yeah, it's good. And I was like, well, how is it compared to the uh, to West Side versus the World? He's like, it's intense. I was like, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, people are gonna think y'all are fucking nuts. And I was like, yes. <laughs> so it's pretty intense. He told me, I'll tell you some stuff about it, but there, it starts off intense and it goes on a wild ride. And then you get like <sighs> a little break for like a couple minutes and then it's like, again. Mm-hmm. so it's a, it's, it's pretty, he said it's an intense one. Um, it's very serious. It's not like it's, it's pretty cool. It, I asked him about like, you know, how the feeling of West Side versus the world it has, it said it, it's, 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 it's good. Okay. He said the, the, the words he said to me were, I'm not going to release another movie unless it at least matches or beats the last one. Mm-hmm. So if you liked West Side versus the world, you will at least like this one or think it's better. Or any other topics you want to talk about that I didn't bring up? Oh, let's see. Oh. Uh, maybe a little WPO stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, I can give you some updates on that because uh, I always stick my nose in and try to get the newest news going on with the WPO. Mm-hmm. And um, I know this year we were at the Olympia, uh, which was our first year there, and um, it was awesome. Like I explained that to you. Like we went over all the Olympia stuff, but it was just a really cool experience. It was a really cool meet. Uh, uh, the Olympia Commission really liked it, apparently, and uh, they're they're really looking forward to next year. Um, I've heard rumors. Now, this is just unsubstantiated rumor that I can either confirm or deny, so I just have to say it like that. Um, I, I think the Olympia is alternating between Vegas and Florida, so next year it's going to Vegas. So if it is in Vegas next year, the WPO Superfinals will be in Vegas at the Olympia there. Um, what are some other things? Uh, they're, they're on a wild expansion right now. So, um, how can I say it? They, I think the, the difference between like the WPO in the past and the WPO today is you had a lot, I think you had idiots running it in the past and, uh, it was good. And then those idiots crashed and burned it. Um, and I think one of the things that those people did was they brought in a lot of foreign lifters. You know, you had like dudes from Latvia, Russia, Ukraine, you know, you had Yarnbash and Vlad and um, who else? Um, just Andy. A- Andy Bolton. Um, there's a couple other big guys I can think of, but you had a lot of, uh, you had a lot of foreign um, uh, participation Mm -hmm. so what they've done is there's a the um wayne has expanded into uh europe asia and uh i think around south africa so there's a guy in portugal that has taken over the uh basically the overseas wpo meets and they're going to start running select wpo meets in europe um asia (laughs) and different parts around the world and they're going to flush those lifters into the super finals at the olympia so that is one cool thing. I think that um, the WPO now is really the only thing it's missing is that influx of some really strong uh, European guys, or maybe not just Europeans, but, you know, I say Europeans, meaning overseas. Um, I think, like I said, that's the difference between the past and, and today. And I think um, once that gets established, it'll, it'll it's pretty much superseded the past in every way, I'm, you know, from being on ESPN. You know, back then, um, the WPO there, they, there was no streaming, you know, back mm-hmm. during that time. If you can think of like mid two thousands, there wasn't streaming devices. There wasn't like a YouTube really. It was very rudimentary. So back then they had to like get a production company to record it. And they tried to sell, uh, like the rights to ESPN or something like that. Like Strongman did. Mm-hmm. It just didn't work out, and then they were kind of behind the times, and the times changed real quick. So I think that's a, there's some reasons why the WPO just kind of the of the pat of yesterday's kind of went away. 
And then um, I know here in the United States, the WPO is um, there's a um, there's rumors going around that um, there's going to be an expansion here. So there's going to be more um, more of the WPO in a different way here in the United States. Um, there, I kind of said it like sometimes people just do the same thing because it's always been done that way. Mm -hmm. And I think this is going to be a new approach at uh, powerlifting, uh, whether it is, and I don't have a ton of details on it. I just have uh, just kind of murmurings of what, what they're getting ready to do, but it's going to be great for powerlifting. It's going to really condense uh, competition. Um, it, you're going to be held to a great standard and uh, you're going to have a voice. And um, a lot of times in these federations, people, um, they they feel like they're just along for the ride rather than giving input like hey i'd like to do these things you know and then, oh we're just doing it this way and for you know this that and the other so i think uh this new this new thing that's coming is gonna is gonna set a new standard it's gonna it's gonna really uh improve i think the, the scope of powerlifting and how it how it's out there right now so a lot of cool things coming down the pipe with that um i always like talking about it because i'm a wpo fan I'm a WPO fanboy, whatever you call it. <laughs> <laughs> and any final thoughts? Oh. Hmm. I don't know. I said a lot of thoughts, final thoughts. <laughs> <laughs> until next time. Yeah, until next time. Um, final thoughts. I know I, I got to say something good here. Let me think of something. There's something I... I should have said, oh, be the change you want to see. Sometimes uh, the easiest way isn't always the best way. Uh, if you want some advice, do the hard thing. Um, narrow is the road. So just if you get the wide road, doesn't always mean the easiest way isn't always the best way. The long, the hard way will get you what you want, maybe not sooner, but in the long run, and you'll have it, so to say. I mean, these are just thoughts, but. And um, you only fail when you quit, you know? Like, everybody fails, but when you stop trying, that's when you fail, you know? So just because uh, you fall off the horse or just because you don't get a, a PR and if you don't, don't have the meat you want after two years or don't have the meat you want after three years, just remember I went through four years twice for five pounds. So, um, if you stay in it long enough, you'll get what you want. Um, surround yourself with people that, that have your same, um, views. You don't have to agree on everything, but you're the same view of what the goal is. You're going to be who you're around. So I guess that's pretty much the the long and the short of it. All right. That works. I want to thank you for having I want to thank you for being you're out welcome. again. We'll have you back out again. We're already kind of talking about that oh, yeah, right so now. We and got the next one. Yeah, coming. so we already got the next one kind of planned out. So thank you guys for listening. We're done. Cool. How long was that? Today's episode is brought to you by Element, a tasty electrolyte drink mix with everything that you need and nothing that you don't. In other words, no sugar, no artificial coloring, no artificial ingredients, no gluten, no fillers, and no BS. With Element, I love the watermelon. The watermelon tastes freaking awesome. I drank one pack every day, no matter what, people that train out here. It's sitting out here for them all the time. The boxes don't last very long. Right now, Element is offering Table Talk listeners a free sample pack with any purchase. That's eight single serving packages free with any Element order. Get yours at drinkelement.com backslash Table Talk. The deal is only available through the link in the description. The other thing is if you don't like it, you can just give it away to a salty friend and Element will give you a 100% refund no risk money back guarantee head over to trankelement.com backslash table talk 
One of the best ways that you can support the podcast and your training is to join the crew. When you join the crew, you get an extra crew cast podcast every single month. <laughs> you also get access to our Discord, which has a training Q&A with Team Elite FTS members. You get form checks. You can upload any of your training footage and have your lifts diagnosed, sometimes within minutes by multiple people. Access to close to 30 different eBooks, training logs, and first sign up access to our weekly and training retreats, uh, train your ass off, and other events that we do. Biggest takeaways from that though, what people enjoy the most and get the most out of is the training Q&A and the form checks, as well as the extra podcast. Hey guys, I'm back in the gym with another limited edition apparel drop. This is the new Live, Learn, Pass On shirt. I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about our cambered grip American cable attachment. This attachment has four grips and it's cambered. So when you flip it, it actually becomes eight grips. And if you turn it upside down, there's actually 16. This is one of our most used cable attachments out in the gym. <clears throat> even got that full range of motion. We got a second limited edition drop this month as well. Head over to EliteFTS.com, pick up the shirt, pick up the cable attachments, and we'll see you next time.